Good morning uh, and welcome to the third meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone in the room to switch off uh, mobile phones um, as they can often uh, interfere with our sound system. Uh, but well, I, I would also uh, ask you to note that you will see some of the committee members uh, using tablet devices this morning, uh, and this is instead of our hard copies of our papers. Um, I welcome again uh, to uh, uh, Patrick Harvey, <coughs> MSP, who's, uh, who's, who's joined us for uh, agenda item number three. Uh, our first item on the agenda today is to continue uh, our stage one scrutiny of the assisted suicide bill. Um, this, uh, this morning we have two roundtable sessions, and the first of these is on palliative care. As usual, uh, with uh, a panel, um, we're going to do the, the introductions ourselves. It's much too long for me to do them. So uh, it, we have also with us, I should uh, introduce Dr Mary Neill, who is uh, the advisor uh, to, to the committee. My name is Duncan McNeill. I'm the member of the Scottish Parliament for Greenland and Inverclyde. Uh, and convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, my name is Bob Doris. I'm Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee and I'm MSP for Glasgow. Uh, and my name is Pat Carragher. I'm Medical Director to Children's Hospice Association Scotland. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Uh, I'm Laura Finlay. I'm the um, Palliative Care Lead for Wales, but I'm also in the House of Lords and um, involved in the debates over Lord Faulkner's Bill. And I've also been on the select committee, I'm sorry, I was on the select committee uh, on um, assisted dying that looked at Lord Joffrey's bill. And good morning, I'm Dennis Robertson, uh, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Good morning, I'm Stephen Hutchison, a just recently retired consultant physician in palliative medicine at the Highland Hospice in Inverness. Good morning, I'm Colin Keir, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Mike McKenzie, MSP Highlands and Islands Region. Mark Hazelwood, Chief Executive of the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care. Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Good morning, my name is David Jeffrey. I'm a lecturer in palliative medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Good morning, I'm Richard Lyle, uh, MSP for the Central Region. Good morning, I'm Richard Mead, Head of Policy and Public Affairs for Scotland for Mary Curie. Uh, Richard Simpson, um, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Patrick Harvey, member in charge of the bill. Thank you all for that. Uh, welcome to you all. And we'll move directly to our first question, which is from Richard Simpson. I should draw attention to my declaration as a member and past chair of Strathcarran Hospice uh, in the context of today, today's meeting. Um, I, I want to open up by challenging our witnesses today, um, all of whom's evidence is, if I am not misrepresenting them, broadly rather against this bill, some more definitely against than others. Um, but can I open up by challenging our witnesses today to say if the Parliament decides to proceed to stage two of this bill and give uh, um, agreement to the general purpose of the bill in stage one, uh, what changes do they think could be made to this bill to, to, to uh, make it a bill which actually would, would work and be appropriate? Yes, Baroness, you, you, if, if, if you would, um, and I'll bring others in. Yeah, you, okay. You uh, well, thank you. Um, having myself worked at Strathcarran many years ago as a, as, as a doctor, and I was a GP in Mary Hill for five years, um, I would say that, first of all, uh, the way the bill is written, uh, most of my patients in Mary Hill and Postle Park would just become automatically included because their life expectancy was much shorter than those people who lived in the wealthier area up the road in Bearsdown and Mulgai. So I, I think that there is a fundamental problem with who you're trying to include. The, the second thing is that you, you, that you have attempted in this bill to take it out of medicine, uh, which is a good thing to do. But by having medicine involved at all, you, you've got a fundamental problem. You've got 4% of licensed palliative medicine doctors are prepared to have anything to do with this. 
96% are not. <coughs> so even the way that this bill might work with that resistance amongst doctors, which is resistance for good reason, it's not going to work. And I, I would suggest <laughs> that you look seriously at taking any processes completely outside medicine so that the adjudication of eligibility or not is completely outside medicine. You've got a concept of licensed facilitators in there, which you could build on. Uh, the title is honest and is to be commended for its honesty. Um, we had a big debate in Parliament over Lord Faulkner's bill, which uses the euphemism assisted dying, and you're being quite clear about what this is. Um, I think you need to specify who would... Uh, be issuing the lethal drugs because this is not medication, this is not treatment, um, it's nothing to do with treatment and this dose of drugs would not be in any formulary because there's no evidence base for it but, but that needs to be in there. And I think you also need to clarify the interface between suicide prevention policies and when the Mental Health Act would kick in uh, because if somebody is turned down for whatever reason. I don't see how a doctor could turn them down, the way the bill is written, actually. So I think you've got a real problem on the interface between the person who is seeking assisted suicide with lethal drugs <coughs> and the person who is suicidal and who would be currently um, managed and supported um, and helped through mental health services, often working in conjunction with, with main medical services. Um, the other thing that I do think becomes important in relation to the doctors is the conscience clause is reserved, as far as I've understood. So you cannot create a conscience clause in Scotland. But they're all of the professional guidelines and so on over conscience and what you do are actually probably not worth the paper they're written on. And we've seen that mid with the midwives at the moment, um, over midwives being involved in managing uh, patients who've had an abortion. But actually a conscience clause isn't going to hold water. Medicine knows that and has no faith in any talk about a conscience clause because they know that they'll get caught up in it. So again, I, m my advice would be that if you're serious about this and you really want to have a system that might actually work, then you put the adjudication with the court deciding who is or is not to be provided and you get a court-appointed person and a court system. Uh, and I think I'll stop there because I could go on for longer. <laughs> You know, there are um, uh, other responses. I see Mark uh, Hazel, Hazelwood. I, I just wanted just a point of clarification because um, Richard's characterised all the witnesses here as having a position of opposition to the bill, and I thought it was really important for me before saying anything else just to to be clear about what the position of the partnership, Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care, is. And in our submission, we've said that we're not able to adopt a position on the principle of whether or not assisted suicide should be legalised. And that's because the topic raises a number of moral, personal, ethical issues upon which many of our member organisations, and I'm thinking here particularly of the Scottish Health Boards, they're un institutionally unable to hold a position on issues of that sort. Um, so the partnership has adopted approach of um, providing information. Um, and then in regard to the interests of vulnerable people and also the provision and practice of palliative care, of directing and suggesting to MSPs areas within this particular bill uh, where there might be a need for particular consideration. Uh, so I appreciate that's a slightly um, nuanced position, but I wanted to be clear that we're, we're not in the, 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 the black and white category that Richard characterised us as. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Dr. Carricker, did you indicate? Yeah, I think we were saying... I think that's uh, an interesting question to draw, draw us out. Um, I would represent the, those probably younger than 25 years old because that's my area of expertise. Uh, and I would have to say I have considerable concerns about this bill if it would become law because I, I think you know children are different than young people, young people are different than adults, and we know there's different maturing rates. And I think for somebody 16 years 
uh, and just over that to make this sort of to be able to make that sort of decision to have the capacity and the full understanding there's increasing amount of work uh, available to us now to show that people even up to the age of 25 don't fully understand the absolute significance that death would be final for them uh, and I have to say in my own work only twice in the last couple of weeks we have the, the opposite that we have do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation that, that some youngsters decide to, to say I'll sign up to that because they think in the event of an acute deterioration they, they don't wish to have intervention. In two cases in the last couple of weeks, both of these youngsters who were very clear in their own mind when the push came to the shove, if I can use that phrase, actually elected for full resuscitation. Of course, they were able to go for that full resuscitation. I don't need to follow the, the discussions through. I, I too could go on, but probably would wish to stop there at this stage. But I'll, I'll, I'll take those who haven't made a contribution. And of course, uh, in these sessions, we, we always uh, defer to our panellists and, 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 and ask the, the politicians to be patient, and we'll bring them in when there's that. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey. These comments, it's not just the doctors in the Association of Palliative Medicine that are opposed to this, that all the major colleges, the College of Physicians, the BMA, the Royal College of General Practitioners, are all against uh, legalisation of assisted suicide, or in England, as it's called, assisted dying. And I want just to put that in the context of a huge problem that we face here in Scotland of recruitment of general practitioners. And I would like the committee to think about the influence this will have on doctors. I think whatever the, old, the complicated ethical arguments that we have about euthanasia... At the bottom line, doctors have a gut feeling, an intuition, that this is something that they just should not be involved with. Is there any other panellists want? Please, uh, Dr Hutchin. One of my concerns is, uh, which might seem like a rather tedious sort of dictionary definitions, but the bill is said to be founded on the principle of autonomy. Um, and I think if this was an important enough principle to state that the, the, the bill is founded on that, then it's important enough that we should address and challenge the whole issue of autonomy. Uh, and I've written extensively about this in the papers that I've submitted. I think autonomy is the wrong word. It's the wrong concept. And autonomy has caused problems in Belgium, as I understand it, where essentially the patient's autonomy is the driver and it seems to supersede the professional judgment of other people. Uh, and therefore the, the widening of the criteria for assisted dying in Belgium. I think that rather than talking about autonomy, because I don't personally believe that autonomy actually exists when you think about it, we should, on the other hand, be talking about choice with responsibility. We function as a relational interdependent society. That's how it works. It doesn't work with autonomy. And therefore I think that we need to look at choice with responsibility. And that to me, puts a completely different emphasis on this whole thing. It's not what the individual chooses and demands. That's part of the equation, but that has to be balanced with a careful scrutiny of what the implications about that would be for the rest of society, and in particular, <laughs> the vast numbers of frail, vulnerable, frightened people that we look after. Uh, thank you. If I, if I may come back and build slightly on what's already been said. Firstly, <clears throat> over the age, and just to illustrate it for you, I, th I hope graphically, I had a, a patient, a young man, who had his third um, tumour, testicular tumour, and was adamant that he did not want any treatment and that he wanted to be helped to die. And this discussion went on not just for weeks but for months. And then uh, he was in his 20s. And then when he was unable to sit up in bed and was really, I thought, in the last 24 hours of life with his, and his parents were sitting at his bedside, he said to me, is it too late for me to try to be treated? Now, we had had weeks and weeks and weeks of discussion but it wasn't until death was absolutely staring him in the face that he really believed that his treatment refusal and desire to death, for death was going to result in his death. Actually, there was a happy outcome because I went and phoned the oncologist. Within an hour, 
we started him on oncological treatment. He had a debulking surgery against all, all odds. And that was many years ago, and he is still alive today. And I see him fairly regularly out walking just socially. Um, and he is glad to be alive. But he's very clear that his desire for death and his desire to have his life shortened wasn't just weeks, as in this bill, with two weeks. But this went on for months and months and months. And I think the age, as well, is important. And up to 25, there is really good psychological, developmental evidence that youngsters don't understand it. The other problem that you've got is that laws send messages... And I think this is a public safety issue. This is about those who are vulnerable to coercion, vulnerable to pressure, vulnerable to feeling that they are a burden. And if I can pick up on the point made by Dr. Hutchison very clearly over autonomy, autonomy was the concept that came from, from Greek states about having their own uh, rules within their society. It, autonomy came as a concept about the fact that we have responsibility to others. And actually, autonomy is relational. And I'm concerned that there is no requirement here at all to think about what is the effect on others, what is the effect on children of a parent taking their life, deliberately foreshortening their life, and being assisted in doing so by the medical clinical services that that young person would then be dependent on in bereavement. How does that person go to the GP grieving? And we know that young people can have a lot of problems and lack of support in grief. How do they go to them when it's been the GP that signed the forms? I put that out as a question to you. Richard, do you want to come? Yes, I think that the question of autonomy is really very interesting, and uh, maybe the witness, witnesses would like to expand on one of the concerns I have, which is about um, vulnerability. Because uh, from my own experience uh, as a doctor, uh, first of all, I would agree with Elora. I have had at least three patients who have changed their minds uh, when confronted with the absolute reality, when it has dawned, when their denial has stopped. Uh, that they are going to die, they suddenly realise actually that they, they want to live and they're prepared to accept treatment at that point. But I, I, what I am concerned about particularly is the, the situation between the family and the individual that, uh, again, in my experience, uh, convener, uh, that, that individuals said to me, I do not wish to be a burden to my family. And, you know what one then did was get the family in to explain that they weren't a burden and they didn't have to go into a hospice or a hospital. They could stay at home. They'd be looked after. But, you know, people do feel that, that at that stage when they're, when they're really quite ill that they become a burden. So I would like to explore a little further how the bill could ensure, if it was passed, that those uh, circumstances of vulnerability, given the psychological problems associated with terminal care, which are not understood by the public very fully, and really by any of us until we face that situation. How do you protect those who are uh, going to make a decision that they wish assisted suicide uh, when in fact they're not doing it for themselves to relieve an impossible burden for themselves, but are doing it because of a, a vulnerability which may or may not be expressed by others, uh, pressure by others? start off with that. Uh, in the paper submitted by Dr. Martin Wilson and myself, Dr. Wilson is a consultant in the care of the elderly in Rigmore Hospital in Inverness. We, we've cited the, the whole issue of elder abuse in the society, which is a major problem. Uh, and I think the, the, the concern is, uh, and I can see that myself because I've been involved in family situations, I can see how the pressure could be there. The, the spoken or unspoken pressure to think, wouldn't it be good if so-and-so uh, no longer was alive, uh, their suffering would be over, um, um, possibly for altruistic reasons or possibly for malicious reasons. The bill leaves, leaves itself wide open to malicious reasons for families wishing to see the end of life of somebody older in terms of their inheritance or the costs of care or, or whatever. The whole issue of being a burden, I think, is, a, is an interesting one. 
And I've approached that in a way in which, which some people might actually find surprising, and certainly I think occasionally my patients and their families did. It would be very common for me to be speaking to, say, a husband and wife, one of whom was ill and the other whom was caring. Uh, and let's say the husband was ill, and he would c commonly say to me, look, I do not want to be a burden to my wife. And we know that the fear of being a burden is a very significant driver for assisted suicide in Oregon. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relevant issue. My response to that, perhaps to their surprise, was to say, well, you are a burden to her. Care is a burden. And I think it's, uh, in, I don't believe that we can realistically say, of course you're not a burden. We are burdens to each other. That is part of the relational nature of our society. And I contend that in a responsible society, we carry each other's burdens. And so in this uh, hypothetical but real husband and wife team, I would say, well, you are a burden. It is a burden for her to look after you. There are demands. She needs to have the opportunity to have a respite and a break. But if the tables were turned, would you do the same for her? And I can't think of anybody who said no. I suppose I'd just to respond to her, but the, 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 the weight of that burden... I beg your pardon? The weight of that burden, you've went into that, 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 that worry. The weight of that burden sometimes weighs hell, heavily on carers, and sometimes it results in the premature death of carers. Because carers are becoming older and looking after older people. So the, the, that, 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 you know, that, that story prompts that response in me. Absolutely. This is not I... just something, somebody who's able to give care freely. I, a burden I... can't just be dismissed as some sort of duty. It has an, in itself has an impact on that other person, that other person's health, quality and life. I don't know, I don't know whether it can be... You know, just gently push away. It was a, it's a burden. I'm, I'm some certainly notional, not some pushing it away. Thing, it, it, yes, of course, a very I'm substantial a... burden on that person means that that person also needs to be supported. And one of the, the sort of lodestones of, of the high quality of palliative care that we have in this country is that we don't just simply care for the patient, but we're caring for the family, the carers, the relatives. Uh, we're looking at social, financial, spiritual issues. We're looking very and holistically I, and I hope, at the situation. I hope we can get... And to that in this session, which we'll deal with separately, about the limit, the limits that palliative end of life care has, because we know that that support is not available, and, and, and throughout Scotland we know that the staffing levels are not available within Scotland. We know that caring levels are under strain, and people are supported sometimes in the community not satisfactory. But we'll, we'll, we'll maybe come to that, Baroness. Thank you, Chairman. I think you've highlighted very eloquently the problem of carer fatigue, uh, which is there and is real. Actually, the um, more mortality, um, early mortality, is amongst those who are bereaved rather than amongst the carers. So, um, it, it, and I think that becomes important to remember because, of course, who, however somebody dies at the end of the day, the, the loneliness and the loss and the grief are the things which seem to actually impact on the immune system and there are physiological reasons why they then become more prone to um, infection, to other diseases, illnesses, not loss of concentration, accidents and so on. And, they, and there is a, a mortality significantly in the year after bereavement. <coughs> the, the other thing, though, if I might pick up on your comments about palliative care provision... The Economist, in its, separ in its independent review of palliative care services around the world, rated the UK at the highest. And I would agree with you that, yes, there are gaps, but I think Scotland, like Wales, has got much better provision across the whole country, actually, than England has. We have much less variability in both those nations in the terms of provision of, of services and outreach. There have been huge educational efforts. Um, people round the table with me have been involved in these for many years in trying to raise the level of education of, of healthcare professionals, precisely to be sensitive to the needs of patients, to be able to look at how do we intervene early, what can we do. But I think one has to remember that palliative care is not a universal 
panacea, and it isn't that it either works or doesn't work. It's not like a dose of antibiotics if you've got a urinary tract infection. You take antibiotics, they either work or they don't work. If they don't work, you try a different antibiotic and you redo the cultures. Palliative care is a whole approach to the whole person, and as you rightly say, it covers not just the physical domain, but the emotional, social, and indeed the spiritual domain, and I don't mean religion in that, I mean much wider than that, in terms of why is this happening to me, and the impact on the whole family. And actually, that is its strength, and I think it is why, in palliative care particularly, there is a very strong feeling that the deliberate act to foreshorten life flies in the face of all of the acts that we undertake to try to improve quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis. And usually, when you find the thing that's really getting people down, it isn't in a clinical domain. It's what you might call the trivia of life but they can really undermine people and their sense of personalhood and personal worth. We'd look forward to hear some evidence about um, 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 palliative care and end-of-life care, because the last review, as we've had in the papers, was 2008 in Scotland. So we don't know, we don't know what's actually happening out there, um, which, which I think maybe some others will testify to. Richard Mead, uh, and I see Mark Hazelwood, I wanted to just make um, two comments. Firstly, um, continuing on the uh, provision of palliative care. Um, we know uh, from studies done um, that Marie Curie is funded in partnership with Edinburgh University and NHS Lothian uh, that uh, access to primary care, uh, to palliative care, can be very variable. For those with cancer, it can be as high as 75%, but those with uh, non-malignant disease, it can be as low as 20%, so uh, only one in five. And again, when they are accessing it, it's only in the last couple of weeks or couple of months of life, not uh, much earlier, which is uh, what a lot of uh, professionals, including people around this table, would uh, say they should be accessing it from. Um, in terms of carers, we also know um, that carers, particularly those caring for people at the end of life, can often be overwhelmed as the patient deteriorates. And uh, we know from studies that uh, a lot of carers uh, particularly when they're close family members, because they don't see themselves as carers. They see themselves as husbands or uh, as uh, sons and daughters. They don't identify themselves uh, as carers, so they don't reach out for the support that might be available for them. So I think we need to look at some of the statutory responses that we have uh, in terms of supporting carers and making sure that carers are getting the support that they need to look after loved ones when they are uh, terminally ill. And again, in terms of the provision of palliative care, um, we definitely need to uh, have a greater focus and see it as a higher priority um, to make sure that people are actually getting palliative care when they would benefit from it. Mark Hazelwood? Yes. Um, I wanted just to say a couple of things about access to palliative care. And I, I think in this field sometimes it's easy to become confused between access to specialist palliative care. And it's interesting that around the table at a palliative care at this session that we have mostly specialists in palliative care. Um, but actually, most palliative care in the health and social care system isn't provided by specialists. Um, and if you look across Scotland's acute hospitals, you'll see that one in three uh, beds is occupied by somebody in their last year of life. And those are in generally in general wards. They're not, not all in. They're not in specialist palliative care beds. Um, so, good care for people towards the end of life. Palliative care is a is a core function of our health and social care systems. It's one one of the main things that our hospitals do. And so, when you think about access to palliative care, um, yes, you can think about whether or not somebody gets to see a specialist or perhaps goes to a hospital. But that's in terms of activity, that's quite a small part of the picture. Um, whether somebody has access to palliative care will depend on things like, does their GP have the skills, knowledge and confidence to initiate a discussion, which might lead to the person um, being able to indicate what their preferences for care would be in the eventuality of their condition deteriorating. Or access to palliative care might be down to is the person admitted to one of the many hospital wards in Scotland um, where the team in charge of their care has the skills, knowledge, behaviours and attitudes to deliver good care towards the end of life? 
or perhaps they're admitted to one of the other wards where uh, we know that those behaviours, uh, skills and knowledge aren't yet in place. So I just wanted to sort of paint that picture as, as, a, as, a, as a wider context. It's a huge part of what the health and social care system does uh, across all settings. I think then I would follow up because I, I, I think you were starting to, to look for information about um, the extent to which people get access um, and the, the quality of care in Scotland. And I, th I think from what I've said in terms of access, I, th I think you get a sense that that's quite a difficult question to answer. And as Elora said, some things like you know, management of symptoms and pain may be relatively easy to I identify and quantify, but the extent to which somebody's psychological and spiritual needs are met is perhaps a bit more complicated as well. But w what I would finish by saying is that I do believe there's an urgent and important need uh, for us to develop better systems uh, to measure uh, the experience of patients and their carers and families in Scotland um, in terms of the care they receive towards the end of their lives. Dr. Carr. Thank you, convener. I'd like to build on those remarks and also try and return to the question that Dr. Simpson asked us. What do, what do we think can make this bill more fit for purpose? Speaking of young people, I have really significant concerns in that because I think the general population doesn't necessarily understand, certainly the parents of children I'm looking after at Children's Hospice Association Scotland aged 14 and 15 don't understand that if their child, when they reach the age of 16 and that child has moderate to significant cognitive abilities, their parents will have to apply under Adults with Incapacity, the Adults with Incapacity Act, to be able to make legal decisions on behalf of their youngster. I'm not sure the bill gives me any reassurance that parents couldn't take that one stage further and decide that what was in the best interests of their child would be assisted suicide. We know with looked after and accommodated children, that usually lasts up to the age of 25. Does that allow local authorities to be making such decisions? Now, I don't think anybody that I know would be wanting to do these sorts of things, but I think it's a real concern that the, the bill, if it was passed, might allow this degree of decisions which arguably would not be in the best interests. Dr. Jeffrey. <clears throat> Simpson's remarks and, and questions about safeguards. I think one of the problems, I, I believe that safeguards in this area are totally illusory. We're, we are kidding ourselves because the complexity of dealing and working with patients at this stage of life, we talk about feeling a burden, that could be an early symptom of depression. We know, and there is hard evidence to show, that we are not good at detecting depression in this particularly difficult group. If we fail, and, and Linda Ganzini in Oregon has shown in her studies elegantly that uh, patients who she has studied have gone forward and had assisted suicide, their depression that she's identified has not been picked up by their clinical carers, and they've gone forward and had assisted suicide. These are people with treatable depression. Um, my, my thought of this is in, in our work is that if you can't diagnose depression, then all safeguards disappear. There's no safeguard there. You've missed the thing altogether, and the patient will move forward because people haven't the time or the skills or the difficult or the or the or the uh, ability for having psychiatric referrals to find out this. And on terms of psychiatric referrals, psychiatrists themselves, you'll note, uh, both in Oregon and here, are not keen to do this capacity work. They themselves admit their limitations. So I think one of the messages I'd like to get across from clinicians to you is. We're saying this is a really difficult area that we struggle with, and it isn't possible to have black and white answers that you require for the law. I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got some, some committee members who want some questions to take on. Rhoda, Rhoda, Rhoda Grant, followed by Bob Dollars. I, ju I just want point. to go back to access to palliative care. I think certainly what we seem to be picking up is concerns of people looking at the bill and looking for assisted suicide because they have or assume that they will have little control about their over kind of their last uh, weeks and months the fear of pain the fear of not having the assistance they require and um, you know although 
yes, we have good quality palliative care where it's available. We don't always have that available. And how do we, I suppose, empower people and equip people um, with the knowledge of what is available and give them choices um, that would then allow them to make decisions about themselves and retain autonomy and control over their own lives because I think it's the lack of control over their pain, their treatment and where they're going to be based can, can lead to a lack of autonomy and if the only choice then is to take your own life that surely isn't a choice at all. How do we, I suppose, make sure that people have um, the access they need and the choices that we should make available to them? Mark Hazelwood, do you want to respond to that? And I think uh, Dr Hutchison. Yes, I, I, an observation really that um, within existing legal frameworks there are many ways in which people in Scotland can um, exercise choice and control and increase the chances of arriving at the sort of care at the end of life and death that perhaps they would choose. And I'm thinking th of things there like advanced directives I'm thinking of also wider things about um, funeral planning, making a will, um, writing a power of attorney so that if somebody loses capacity, then somebody they trust can take decisions for them. And I, th I think one of the interesting things is that the level of uptake of those um, vehicles which are there already is really quite low in Scotland. And so I think we've got a wider problem here uh, where we have, I think, a cultural reluctance to um, talk about end-of-life issues and um, also as a result of that low levels of public knowledge and awareness and also it has to be said high levels quite often of professional discomfort in initiating discussions around this area and um, so even leaving aside the issue that we're here this morning we have a, an issue that we need to tackle in terms of creating a much greater open dialogue about death, dying and bereavement in Scotland, which has potential benefits for um, well, the 220,000 people who are bereaved each year in Scotland, the 40,000 people who die in Scotland. So it's really much bigger. Um, End-of-life issues are much, much bigger than the particular sort of narrow issue that we're here to, to discuss today. Thank you. Yes, we, uh, just drawing one or two threads together, and we are coming back, Convener, to one of the things that you said you wanted to address earlier, but we seem to be focusing on it at this point, and that is the, the, the accessibility and the availability of palliative care more widely, uh, and uh, Rhoda Grant is saying, how can we do that? Um, well, I guess that is uh, in the hands of our politicians, but it is quite well articulated in the Scottish Government's Living and Dying Well document. And my contention would be that... Uh, bearing in mind what Professor Finlay said, that we, we lead the world in terms of the quality of palliative care, it would be a far more productive exercise for our government, rather than to be pursuing assisted suicide for the few, to be focusing our efforts, our care and our investment into all those people, not simply with cancer. Palliative care for, with, for people with cancer is good, but there are big gaps in palliative care for people with other chronic degenerative conditions and so on. And one particular thing that I would encourage would be that the money that we have should be invested in community care. That's where there's a big gap in my mind, to the, that people are supported in their communities and that they have, you know, increasing the, the, the profile, if you like, of palliative care issues, as Mark Hazelwood has said uh, and as Dr Jeffrey has said, um, increasing that and making sure that people are, have access to care and support in the community, not in hospitals, I and mean, that's there are gaps there, I know, but not necessarily just hospitals or hospices, but in the community. You'll get far more bang for your buck, I suggest, if we invest in community than if we invest in buildings. I, th I think I think part of the reason that you know we have a panel that taken into account uh, Mark Hillswood's declaration that, that generally support uh, uh, opposed to, to the bill. So we're testing some of it. And I, I think we're looking at limits of it and we're looking at the palliative people involved in palliative care who offer that as an alternative <laughs> to something that, that is unacceptable. So that's I think that's where it, it takes us to the whole question about the limits of palliative end-of-life care uh, and indeed, um, uh, uh, you know, 
access to it, etc. And the papers that we have in, in terms of uh, the, the progress that's been made and examples of living and dying well actions and progress in achieving them are disappointing. That's, that's the evidence. You know, there has been slow progress. 50% of people still die in hospitals. That's, the case. that's been the case for the last 10 years. Most people, um, you know, uh, you know the, the unmet need for uh, palliative care and end-of-life care. Who gets it? Who doesn't? These are these are important issues. If 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 you're putting that to us, that the the system we have is much better than what would be pros, proposed by the, the proposal of the bill. So you know, we've got to examine these areas. That's that you know that's the context. I think that we're that we're examining this morning as part of the context. But Dr. Carrick, did you want in? Yeah, and then Baroness. On that front, uh, I do concede that too many people die in hospital, but I just want to represent figures from our own organisation where um, a third of the youngsters are dying at home, a third of the youngsters are dying in hospital, a third are dying in a children's hospice. So there, there is progress that, that, that's going on, just, just to answer that. And I would like to see it quicker, and I would very much agree my, my first postgraduate training was as a general practitioner. And I think you know, primary care services are the ideal environment in which to provide good palliative care, not spa, specialist palliative care, because not everybody needs that specialist palliative care. <coughs> Thank you. I'm just going to say that dying is ubiquitous. So it is really important to think about the generalist being educated in core palliative care skills as well as having specialist services that are available. And the, it's that availability I was talking about. You have to start education in medical schools. You have to expose every medical student to being with somebody who's dying. That isn't happening at the moment. You have to incorporate education and end-of-life care into all of your nursing curricula. You haven't got that at the moment. And you have to have seven-day services because disease does not respect the clock or the calendar. People have crises out of hours. They have to be able to access care. So if you really want to address seriously, as a, 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 um, a jurisdiction, the need of patients who are facing end-of-life care then you have to get seven-day services available so that whenever a problem arises, they can rapidly access support and they know who to go to. And yes, they have to have open discussion, but good palliative care is about empowering people to have choices, choices in what they have, where they're looked after, who's looking after them, listening to what they need and helping them find a way through and adapt to the ever-changing situation of their disease. And I would just add that as a clinician, patients who've expressed a desire for death that has not been related to the quality of services available to them, that is a different construct internally. And it is often because they have been unable to see a way through past the fears that were so clearly uh, laid out by, by you just now, um, by Rhoda Grant, because it is fear of the future which can be absolutely crippling, and it isn't until people experience what can be done and have the confidence in those around that they will see a way through. So I wouldn't want you as a committee to believe that it's either <coughs> or, because we look after patients who will express a very profound desire for death, but that desire for death evaporates when they get the care that enhances their dignity and their sense of personal worth. Could, could somebody say something about actually identifying people who, who, who may require palliative or end-of-life care? I think there are, before the access problem, there is a question of identifying the numbers of people who may benefit from it. But Richard Mead uh, was wanting in, were, were you, Richard? Yeah, I was wanting to return to sort of the, the some of the stuff we were talking about, government policy and, and sort of leadership in that area. Uh, the palliative care review that was carried out by Audit Scotland was in 2008 and Living and Dying Well was 2008. So those documents are both quite um, out of date now. Um, and health and social care, as we know, has moved on significantly, both in terms of policy and organisation. Um, the current 20 
2020 vision the Scottish Government um, has for healthcare makes no, mef- no reference whatsoever to death, dying, terminal illness or palliative care. Um, a document which is our guiding light in terms of uh, where we go with health and social care in Scotland. So that needs to be re- uh, addressed. Um, the Scottish Government has committed to producing a new uh, strategic framework for action for end of life and palliative care, which we have been promised uh, it would be published in April or the spring this year. And I think we need to put a a lot of scrutiny on that framework to make sure it's fit for purpose and will actually help um, support all of those people across Scotland who might uh, need palliative care and to make sure that they get it regardless of their condition. Yes, Dr. Rogers. If I just make one further comment about that, um, that uh, I think all of us who've been practicing palliative care, and indeed uh, anybody with general practice experience around this table will recognize that, uh, and, and we acknowledge that we cannot fix everything. But I think it's very important that we don't get drawn into the frame of mind where we feel that we should be able to sanitize the messy by ending people's lives. Palliative care is a very, very difficult specialty. Uh, We are dealing with people with lots of distress, and we acknowledge that. We're not pretending that can all be fixed. Um, But it's a holistic approach to to tackling that, and I think we've got to be careful that we don't see that this can be sort of sanitised and made fine just by ending some people's lives or making that available to them. Rhoda doesn't want to come back with anything. I've got, I've got a number, Dennis, but I've got you on the list. I'm sorry, I should have let you know. Mm-hmm. I, I think that is interesting, and certainly the availability of palliative care in the community. But I, I suppose one of the big issues for people is things like pain control. And if you're looking at communities, especially in rural areas, um, the like of which I represent, getting that kind of pain control quickly into the community so that people have that control over their own management. How do you do that? How, how do you actually make that happen you know, at home for people in the right location? And quickly, you know, you don't, if you're in a lot of pain, you don't have, want to wait hours um, for an on-call, somebody to arrive, you know, because actually they can't save your life, so you fall in priority. Sorry, uh, uh, we we have a huge rural problem in central Wales and what we've done is, is put in just-in-case boxes and try to have anticipatory prescribing. And so early on, when somebody is clearly has disease that may be unstable, that the family and whoever is there is taught what to do and it's clear to them what they should be giving somebody in the event of a crisis. Now, actually, if the drugs are in the house, you can talk through over the phone if you know the patient while somebody is going out to see the patient. But I would agree with you, it is unacceptable to wait, and I would agree that it is completely unacceptable to wait if you don't have seven-day services. And I, I really can't stress that strongly enough, because why should somebody on a Sunday have to wait because nobody's thought ahead of time. It's about anticipating and making sure that things are there in the house. Now, that is medication given at a specific dose. If I might return to the bill, what you're talking about is a massive lethal uh, quantity of drugs, which it looks from this bill as if those might be left in the house for the person. And I'm not sure from this bill how on earth you're going to make sure that somebody in extremis or just because the family are fatigued at the weekend isn't coerced into then taking their lethal drugs because you don't have a system in this bill of the drugs being taken out at the time that somebody determines they want to end their life. So I'm I'm trying to return to to the bill for a moment and and, and what we have on the table in front of us. But I I think that, again, is another problem and I, I don't see any way, any safeguard in here or any way of detecting coercion and, I, and I've been taken in by families. Other people will have been taken in by families. I had one family. The family kept on that this woman's pain control was inadequate. And each time I went to her, she said, no, I think I'm fine. I'm comfortable. Her birthday came. It was a muted birthday celebration. But then you wouldn't go, whoopee, it's your last birthday, mum. Um, so we all understood that it was a quiet celebration. After that, the family didn't visit much. 
And at night, one night, she couldn't sleep. The nurse gave her a hot chocolate and sat with her and said, well, it's a pity your family don't get in as much. And she said, well, no, because my fixed-term life insurance policy expired on my birthday. And they've lost out on £11,000. Now, we all believe that this was a loving, caring family. We were all completely taken in. And I've got other families I've been completely taken in by and believe that they were loving and caring. So the issue of coercion, and we've already heard about elder abuse, is real. And I see that as a danger with the bill that you've got before you. I would concur with what you've said, Baroness, in, in response to your question. I would say that, that with young people working across Scotland, we're doing increasingly good anticipatory care. We're putting in just-in-case boxes which have these medicines. Uh, and so I would also want to say, in my experience, actually, in rural and remote Scotland, we often have quicker response times than we have in inner city areas because people are prepared to cross boundary with, with their jobs. And I see that nearly every day in my job. But to build on, on what Alora has said as well is, one of my real concerns as a, as a practitioner uh, working with young people in palliative medicine is sometimes I have to use really high doses of medicine to control and to manage symptoms, higher than perhaps adult doses. And my real concern is, if this bill goes ahead, is what sort of doses are going to be required to actually achieve suicide? Or if you don't achieve suicide, where's the person going to be if the doses available don't actually do the job that they were I'm not sure the word is prescribed for, but, but so a real concerns are on that front, and, and, and we don't seem to have any evidence base on what sort of medicine doses to use for anybody, but particularly for young people. Bob Doris. Um, thanks, Kilvina. Um, I kind of wanted to return to uh, the situation where someone, for whatever reason, feels they, they can't go in living with uh, chronic pain or a life-limiting condition, their quality of life is, is beyond the pale. I, I was struck by Barnes Finlay's comments about a GP in Maryhill Estate in, in Maryhill, and I just wanted to check some figures for suicide rates in that part of North Glasgow at the moment, and they are, they are significantly higher than the, the Scottish average, and I thought I would check prescribing rates for anxiety and depression. So in, in Maryhill, it's 44% above the Scottish average. In Springburn, it's 44% above the Scottish average. It's 58% um, above the Scottish average in, in Postle Park, for example. I say that because I'm, I'm feeling that those who are most likely to seek assisted suicide may have other factors that, that, that lead them towards that because of other poor outcomes they have in their lives separate from the physical health condition that they have, and this may impact socially differently across across the country. So some comments on that would be appreciated, but actually the, what I had in my head, and this is following a line of questioning from last week, would be um, if it's unavoidable that there would have to be a medicalisation of the whole process of assisted suicide. So if someone is going to their GP in Maryhill or Postle Park or Springburn, and uh, whether it's heart disease or diabetes, or but th th their quality of life is considerably poorer. They have a life-limiting condition. It's, it's progressive. There are many, many people in that situation. Should the GP have a responsibility, should this legislation be passed, to say you've got a variety of options available? I believe Richard Mead spoke about <coughs> what the statutory obligations were, and it doesn't say this in the bill, at all, but the bill is a very slimline bill without much additional guidance uh, in the way of that. So I'm just wondering whether you felt that whether it be those in palliative care or whether it be GPs or those providing social care, indeed on a statutory basis, whether a natural progression of, of this bill, if it was successful to be passed into law, would, would mean that there, there should be an obligation or there could be an obligation in statutory partners, including the medical profession, to say to individuals, um, and I've given the points about 58% in Springburn on, on antidepressants, 44% in Maryhill, to say to individuals, you have another option available. That other option is assisted suicide. In other words, who would be left to suggest to someone, should anyone ever be suggesting to someone, you have an option and that option is assisted suicide? If that should happen, what are the safeguards we would need around that? 
If that shouldn't happen, how would an individual get the knowledge and information to empower them to make a decision over ending their own lives? Yes, I, I hes hesitate <laughs> to come back in, but, but I, I'm just brimming over. I, 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 my practice covered Postal Park. I know it well. Um, and you're absolutely right. The interface with mental health services is really important and has got to be addressed. And that's why right at the opening I said I think that you need to take this out of medicine. It's really hard trying to look after that population with multiple comorbidities who may see very little future ahead of them. I would be very, very worried about a doctor ever suggesting to a patient that they should think about ending their life because you give the message that I believe that you'd be better off dead. You also reinforce the sense of hopelessness and you reinforce the sense of despair. And I think it was the College of Physicians who said very eloquently, and I paraphrase this because I can't remember it verbatim, that actually the doctor's duty of care does not include being in any way part of a patient's suicide. Bob, can, can we just press that one a wee bit, you, you know, because we referred to it earlier and it's, and, and it's in the evidence in terms of the difficulties and those hard, those necessary sometimes decisions with GPs, medical profession to discuss the end of that person's life mm. and we know that that is a difficult process. So how do we, how, where, where is that in the middle of this? If it's, okay. if, if, can you apply the same principle to... Well, we can't really talk about you, you've got a terminal illness because that's me giving up on you. No, but, but that's What's not the, the case at all. Please, please help me there. Just, yeah, sorry. Yes. Just, just absolutely, before you answer it, I mean, I mean the, light, the, light, the line I took in my questioning does show the concerns I have, but just in the same spirit that Dr Simpson also said in his initial question, at the tail end of it, I did say, how can you build in safeguards? Because yeah, it's the job of this sure. committee, not just as individuals to have views on this bill, but to seek to improve it and make it more robust as it, as, as yeah. it does go through parliamentary process. Yeah. So, yes, I've got significant concerns, but also in answering that, how do you build in those safeguards? Yeah. Can I try and answer yeah. that one Sorry, then? And, and that is that when you, when you have a patient in front of you who see, who've, who've, you believe may have a terminal illness, nowadays you have a duty to be completely open with them, not that not the old collusion type medicine that used to happen when I qualified. But you talk openly with patients and listen to what their concerns are. Part of our job day in, day out is to listen to people's views about their dying, their fears about their dying and what they feel they want. If you want to look at how to improve this bill, I think that you should not make the doctor be the person who sits in judgment over whether or not they are suffering enough to be eligible for assisted suicide. What you do is you maintain that doctor's duty of care to do everything they can to improve the person's quality of life and to carry on providing care. But if you have a system within a legal framework, that person can, if they are intent on having assisted suicide, apply to a court. Your court could then take evidence of the medical condition and the predicted um, pathway of that person's condition. Prognosis is impossible to predict, and, and, and we know it's fraught with inaccuracies, but you can say what you think is likely to happen to somebody. And as any court does, it can gather evidence. In the England and Wales system, the Family Division of the High Court is the place that takes those type of decisions already over treatment cessation, the management of the Siamese twins, where one was going to be sacrificed, difficult Jehovah's Witness, blood transfusion decisions, and so on. And the evidence comes in, but you leave the doctor carrying on providing the care. You've already got the, the concept of a licensed facilitator. And if that was sat with the courts, I think that would be safer than potentially with the campaign groups, which is where it could sit at the moment, the way the bill's written. And if we look for a moment at Oregon, the campaigners describe themselves as the guardian of the law. And I find that very worrying that a campaign group could see themselves as guardians of the law because it should be the jurisdiction of the land that is. So the licensed facilitators could be contained and monitored. And if you put in a monitoring commission 
that actually examines the processes and collects the data about what happened when somebody has died. You will then pick up, um, as happens, but not very adequately, there are attempts to do it within the Dutch system. The, the Oregon system doesn't adequately have a monitoring commission, it just collects data. But even from that, we know that some patients have woken up again after they've had their lethal drugs. They haven't gone on to commit um, suicide later on. So that raises interesting questions. And the time from taking the lethal dose to death is on average 26 minutes, but it can be up to 102 hours, which is a very long time. But you take the whole thing out of medicine, but you leave for that very vulnerable population, and I remember them well, who are living with all kinds of comorbidities and social problems, and poverty really um, ingrained, in a way, in the way that they're living, that you don't allow that the doctors to be suggesting that things look so bad, but actually you, you ensure that their mental health services and everybody else is there to support the patient. But if they are determined, that they can then apply to a court. Dr. Jeffrey. I just want to return to Bob Doris's um, very pertinent question about the social issues and so on. The present law that we have banning uh, doctors being involved in any way in hastening patients' death actually protects us as clinicians because we have a duty with patients who we suspect may be suicidal or certainly with patients who are depressed. We have a duty to actively explore whether they have had suicidal thoughts. So we might ask, you know, have things ever got so bad that you thought life isn't worth living? Now that's a very safe question for me to ask today because the patient in front of me knows, well, this doctor is not He's asking me because he's concerned to see how depressed I am, not that I'm going, do I want to have my life ended? But once you've got the law as a possibility that that is actually one of his choices, two things happen. One is you can't really have that conversation because they're going to think immediately, well, he doesn't think I'm worth bothering about. Um, and, and I think then the other thing, I think, too, is that we need to be aware of Chochinov's work on dignity, which you may have heard before, which people sometimes use the, I can't go any longer, will you help me to die, as a test question to you. Do you think I still really matter, doctor? And they're looking to us as a mirror to see and to reflect that they still are, of course, of value and of worth. And then we are open then to, so my short answer is we can then explore these difficult issues because we're protected by the law. If we bring in this assisted dying law, those conversations will not be possible. Dr. Carragher and then Dr. Hutchinson. I very much hear what you're saying. Bob, I, I too live in Maryhill and popping into a supermarket there lets me see people in all different sorts of situations and I, you know, I think it must be very difficult to, to, to raise the profile of medicine and, and palliative care. I, I suppose two things on that front. One is the bill, as I understand it, means that you should have a terminal prognosis. And certainly from my own field of medicine, that's very, very difficult to do in, in terms of young people and, and stating their, their palliativeness. The Baroness has already stated that a few minutes ago, that I, I think, and, and you were trying to take, a, take us there a little earlier, convenient. how do we decide if somebody has a terminal condition and, and how far down that disease trajectory are they before they're considered for this bill? But supposing they do have a, a, a terminal prognosis of one to two years, that's probably outside, outside this bill, but you know that, that's going to even reduce it ages less in these communities where we've already got this huge disparity in Scotland between different populations uh, and the populations you've said have the lowest longevities already. Just to emphasise one of the points that Dr Jeffrey was making and that is that we have been able to enjoy the, um, a, a safe and supportive uh, environment in which we can raise these issues with patients or respond to issues that they raise with us. That has happened countless times throughout my career. And I, I would say that if, if we're looking at the, the legal and technical nuances of this, do I understand them all? No, I certainly don't. Do I have a full grasp of all the moral, moral and ethical issues about this? No, I don't. I've got some appreciation of all of these, but certainly not full. But please hear this. I would say, am I absolutely 100% cast iron sure 
that if assisted suicide had been available, that would have compromised the care of the patients I've been looking after over the last 20, 30 years? The answer is yes. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I really, it's a couple of comments, and, and I think, <coughs> uh, Dr. Hodgson, you, you mentioned um, the, the, the term burden. Uh, and prior to that, you were mentioning autonomy and definition. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the definition is of burden at the moment. Um, but I, I just wonder, as society, uh, we sometimes... Uh, burden's a very emotive term, uh, again. But we actually adjust to situations in terms of care and the provision of care. And it does impact on, on how we live our lives. And sometimes we're doing it as as parents, as family members, and sometimes we look to the, the wider community to assist us in that. And I'm just wondering, when we're looking at this, it was a point that uh, Baroness Finlay made when you uh, uh, introduced the coercion and fear. Um, it brought me to one of the submissions that uh, in Belgium, where the twins were deaf, and the, the prospect of going blind. Now, I suspect that they may have had ushers, but it doesn't say in the submission, uh, and they opted for euthanasia. Now, my, my concern here is, in going back to the burden and the fear, is that people with, <clears throat> with recognised uh, complex needs, and especially those maybe we, we, we uh, associate with disability, um, we really don't want to convey the message that they are a burden, and we don't want to sort of convey this aspect of fear in terms of living their lives. How do we get over that? What I was saying about a burden earlier was, <clears throat> I hope not taken as a sort of isolated, rather dismissive discussion. It was in the context of the deep and yeah. meaningful discussions that we have in, in palliative care. And, and recognising the issue of being a burden is actually sometimes uh, aimed at... Um, helping the patient to see that the, the carer also needs support, but it's perfectly legitimate for that care to continue um, at home or wherever. Uh, and, uh, um I think my point is that we have a lot of people in society at the moment, uh, if we had to take that forward, that, that could sort of fall into that ca category of being burdensome. Uh, whether well, they're not really, you know, they're living their lives and they require maybe additional support uh, to to live their lives, and this is why I introduced the the, the people with disabilities and maybe complex needs, um, and, and I'm just trying to ensure that we don't sort of affix a, a term um, to a group of people that are maybe very positive about their outcomes uh, and living with conditions. But it's the people who are not feeling very positive who are often raising the question about burden. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, um, uh, and, and, I mean, the, one of the other examples was the one <coughs> with a, uh, um, the, 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 the young girl with anorexia. Now, I mean, quite often people with anorexia uh, often ask that, that, that to die. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, quite, it's quite normal, if we want to use that term, for, for people with uh, conditions like anorexia. <coughs> to actually say, you know, I, I really do want to die. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but, but the, the condition itself is, is, is so prominent um, that, that that's how they feel at the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm really just trying to explore that. How do we safeguard? Because there's, within the bill, I'm not sure we've got the safeguards there to, to help us move away from the coercion uh, and to help us protect people with long-term conditions um, and I'm not sure it's there and sort of try and explore the fear aspect. Yeah. A couple of people indicated Dennis that they yeah. wish to respond. Baroness and Mark Hazelwood. I'll, I'll take Mark. Mm. Okay. Mm. Just to switch it out. Yeah. Take, take Mark first. Good. Mark Hazelwood. Yeah, I, I and this was one of the major points that we made in our uh, submission of evidence was that um, surely one of the things in respect of the groups that um, Dennis has just been talking about is that the criteria set out in the bill for eligibility for assisted suicide should be very clear so that it's quite possible to see from the bill the sorts of people who would be eligible and the sorts of people who wouldn't be. Um, 
And we made the point in our submission that the terms used in the bill, terminal or life-shortening illness and progressive condition, they're not really, we feel, precise enough um, to form part of clear eligibility criteria. And the bill doesn't define either terminal or life-shortening. Um, and it's also not clear what the intended difference between those two terms is. Um, and I think if the terms are not clear, then the Scottish public and the health professionals are left not knowing who is eligible um, and who isn't eligible, and then there's the potential for inconsistent application of different people's conceptions of what those terms might mean. And I don't think it matters whether you're for this change in the law or against it, actually. I think everyone needs to be clear about what the eligibility criteria are and what the scope of the legislation is. I'm Mark. I'm Liz. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for raising this because I think there is a real danger in taking a very utilitarian approach and believing that if you are so-called able-bodied that somehow that you are better than somebody who has a disability. And I think it would be helpful possibly for the committee if I uh, pull out the speeches from Baroness Campbell and um, from Tanny Gray-Thompson on the bill that's before um, the, the House of Lords at the moment. Because Baroness Campbell, for most of her life, has fitted the definition of, having a, a, of being terminally ill as would be either in Lord Faulkner's bill or actually within this bill, she'd certainly fall in the ambit of it. She's now on a ventilator and actually has her ventilator when she's in the chamber and can speak while she's on her ventilator. Now, the, those people with severe disability are very, very frightened of any legislation along these lines because they already find that it is difficult to be viewed as of equal worth within the healthcare system that we have, she has had many occasions where it's been suggested to her that possibly this is the time that she should give up. Um, and particularly, there was an instance a few years ago when she was already in the Lords, but people thought that this was now the end of her life. Um, and she contributes greatly. There is also, sadly, within our society, a, a prejudice against particularly severe disability. And I've heard people say, and Tanny Gray-Thompson spoke openly about it herself, people will say to her, oh, well, it must be awful to be incontinent. Well, actually, she, she has no sensation, particularly from the waist down, and would classify as such. But then lots and lots of able-bodied people, actually, you discover, have a bit of incontinence when you go into it. And it doesn't make them any less worth. But if people behave badly towards somebody and make them feel they are of less worth, as Harvey Chochnoff's research has shown, mm -hmm. then it undermines their sense of personal worth and can make them feel that the only option is that they should be dead and somehow they have a duty to be dead. And I think that's behind some of, of the very powerful messages that have come from those with severe disability. But if it would be helpful to the committee, I'll extract those speeches, because I think they put it far better than I can. Thank you for that, that offer. I'm, I'm, uh, with your permission, Dennis, I'm going to go to yeah. Colin Keir. Um, and, and then, uh, Richard Lyle. Well, thanks, <laughs> convener. And you know, nobody said it was going to be uh, not interesting. This, I think the... Um, from what I've heard, and I was particularly taken by some of the stuff that uh, Baroness Finlay's just said in terms of, and I think the key word here is some uh, people may feel, some people may feel whatever. It's not exact. Um, and the example that was given, uh, Baroness Campbell, was it? Yeah, Joan uh, Campbell. Yeah, Baroness yeah, Campbell. who obviously made a conscious decision to fight and live her life as she wished to, that would not bring her in any sense within the Assisted Suicide Act, simply because of the fact that suicide is what it is. It's not euthanasia. We're not asking for somebody else's input. That's my take on that. Okay. Um, the, other thing, the other thing, if I may... Okay, it's if, just a matter of fact. If, yeah. if, 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 I, if I may, 
Um, the other issue is in terms of earlier on in the discussion when there was the way that I was hearing it, maybe it's being partially deaf, I may have cottoned it on slightly wrongly, but it's almost as if at one point we're looking down the um, an either or. I think somebody else mentioned that as well uh, in terms of palliative care and assisted suicide, where I believe that if this was to be enacted, it's not a case of either or. And the I mean, surely palliative care is what it is. I wouldn't actually expect anybody who is uh, um, acting in the palliative care sector to actually be suggesting um, uh, suicide to anyone. Um, and I say this through the experience I've had as a carer on a long-term, uh, rel uh, relative with long-term um, degenerative illness. So it's a case of, I, I hear reasons why we can't, but it's the generalisation I find really quite off-putting in the way that it's been put across, simply because I know that the person that I dealt with, uh, extremely long care, went into palliative care, but even at that point actually was contemplating suicide towards the end. Now, it's not the same as everybody, because the people in the same uh, 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 care as uh, my relative was that would not have contemplated this. So I think, the, and I, I find it extremely worrying that we start getting into the, the pressure. Maybe it's something I have to think about more uh, in my own view before we take this bill to wherever it happens to go. But certainly I find it rather worrying that we have very general um, uh, considerations here. Maybe we have to do that because of the type of debate we're having. But I do find that the individual is the one who's either going to decide through the period of palliative care, surely, I'm sorry, I've just had enough of this. And at what point do we actually help someone go forward and either we talk to them, I would expect palliative care operatives to be trying to go through everything they could but at some point you're going to have a position somewhere where a patient is just going to say, no, I really have had enough. And I'd like to see some consideration of how that would be dealt with at that point. Any any takers? You want to make I, some clarification yeah, anyway, Barnas? I, I did. I'm, uh, just, just for a point of fact, I'm sorry I, I should have explained. Baroness Campbell herself at times in her life has spoken openly about feeling suicidal uh, and feeling that she had n no purpose in life and uh, about giving up and that was some some years ago and she would have fitted the definition of this <coughs> bill and and if I may um, Kamina while I, while I have um, your ear um, my own mother was actually in a situation similar to the one you describe. She was in a hospice bed. It was at the time that I was opposing Lord Joffrey's bill, and she was extremely angry with me that I was opposing Lord Joffrey's bill because she was desperate to have assisted suicide. And this went on for weeks. And it was, she had excellent care. It was nothing to do with the quality of care. But she just did not want to carry on and did not want to be a burden. And she had been fiercely independent all her life. It was actually an argument with the chaplain uh, that she had, which made her suddenly realize that her brain worked. And he had the sense to say, you're a very interesting lady. Can I come back and talk to you tomorrow? And they argued about philosophy that she had been interested in. And she began to think, well, perhaps I still have something to offer, thanks to his intervention. And it was nothing to do with faith, because that didn't come onto her radar. Um, and she then came home against all odds. And four years later, having been at home and lived independently... She wrote and was very clear that she was glad that she had had those four unexpected years and they had been, the, in some ways, the most rich years of her life. 
But at the time that she was in that hospice, she was definitely somebody who, irrespective of what I felt, would have gone for this bill. But later on, and she made a radio programme about it as well, was glad that she wasn't able to. Hold that out. Um, thank you for your, your, your comments, uh, Colin. But I, I, I would, in a sense, go further than what you're saying. Um, it's not just that people on occasions reach the position where they're contemplating uh, the end of their life or wishing it would come sooner or saying that they've had enough. I would say that that happens in a huge number of the people that I look after. And these are the people I'm concerned about who might come under pressure and influence if this were to be the law. Many of my patients have said that they've had enough. And these are the people who were engaging in supportive uh, conversations um, in, in the course of their care. But I would have to say that over 25 years or thereabouts of working in palliative care, um, how many people can I count who have had this determined and fixed wish that somebody would end their lives? I can think of one when I worked in Edinburgh, and I'm hard pushed to think of any others since then. Uh, but what I do know is that the vast majority of our patients, and I'm just reminding you what I said earlier, we can't make everything uh, nice and rosy and pink uh, in palliative care. It's messy, it's horrible, it's distressing and so on. But what I do know is that the vast, overwhelming majority of the people I've looked after, even those who have expressed this wish that you know they've had enough, will testify at the end and their families will confirm that palliative care, good care, Good individual involvement, good listening, good attention to detail, good hard work, that's what made the difference to them. That's what they uh, appreciated and that's what they thank us for. And I think that could be repeated endlessly around this room. Um, we all know the testimonials that we receive from our patients and their families. I just want to what Stephen's saying there. Um, I've worked in children and young people's palliative medicine for 18 years and exclusively for the last eight <laughs> as a, a full-time job. And as I've always said, it's almost a surprise to me because I ask lots of open questions trying to see where people are. And no young person or no young person's parents in that 18 years has said to me, I, I want you to help my child or that young person saying... I want you to help end my life. Nobody has said that, and I think it's just worth putting that anecdotally on record. Nobody's approached me like that. Does Mark Hazelwood and Richard Mead, do you, is there any nuances here in terms of your position? Mark, you, 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 get, you indicated that caveat that you weren't necessarily, uh, as opposed to this bill, uh, or it shouldn't be presumed that you're pr pr opposed to this bill. Would you, is it at this point you're going to explain that? Um, I think I've really set out why we have the position that we have, and it's to do with um, we're a membership organisation and the, many of our members, particularly the NHS boards, um, are institutionally unable to adopt a position on the, on the bill because it covers moral, ethical, um, personal dimensions. Um, so we're, 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 we're not seeking a, a change in the law um, at present, and I think we would like to see the focus on making sure that palliative care, the kind of palliative care that Dr. Hutchins just described, is available to everybody that might benefit from it, because at present in Scotland, it's certainly the case that not everybody is, and if they do get it, it often comes uh, much uh, too close to the end, and actually they could have been benefiting for far longer. Dr. Jeffrey. And on what's been said about dealing with um, intractable or unrelieved suffering, of course this is very difficult. And one of the privileges of being a palliative care physician is that very difficult cases are referred to us by our colleagues. And one of the other dynamics I want you to be aware of, that it's not just carers who feel affected by this, that through mechanisms of transference and counter-transference, Doctors themselves can perceive a situation to, f to be hopeless and they feel helpless. So the patient feeling helpless can be transferred to the, the doctor who begins to feel helpless. So the patient who feels hopeless, it's not worth going on. The treating team can begin to feel, particularly if they're not experienced in this work, yes, they're right, this is hopeless. And it's only when someone perhaps comes in from outside and is able to have another look at this and say, well, maybe there's a different way of doing this. Maybe we can't make everything right, but let's look at some of the things we can. And the other thing which is perhaps undermined is, 
is the promise that palliative care gives that I will not abandon you, I will be with you. And that might sound rather feeble in high-tech medicine, but to have someone alongside you when you're suffering is a huge boost and, and I think makes an enormous difference in this type of work. And the other thing is that you were commenting, uh, I think, um, Colin Keir, that you're disappointed about the generalities. All the palliative care physicians and health workers around this table could give you very lurid individual cases, but we are bound by confidentiality even after death. I can't tell you about the people who change their minds. I can't make it identifiable to you, but we can just trust us that this happens day in, day out in our practice. I've got Richard Lyle from committee members. I don't know whether committee members... Right? Okay. Uh, I, thank you, convener. Uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, Dr David Jeffrey, but I also have to agree with Colin Keir, and I also have to listen intently to the, the comments you've made, and, and I respect every one of you in the, in the way that you've handled your evidence and also what you do in the field that you do, but... If I turn to the point that Mark uh, Hazelwood made earlier on, you know, none of us want to talk about this. None of us want to talk about death. When my mother-in-law and father-in-law were nearing the end of their life, they didn't want to talk about how I would uh, see how they would be buried and, and, and make arrangements, etc., etc. When, unfortunately, my mother-in-law died and my, my father-in-law, we, we put him into a, an excellent home and we wanted him to go on, but unfortunately, three months later, he didn't. And, and as he was taken to the hospital one night, um, you know, with a heart attack, he was in his, his 90s then, uh, he actually said to the nurse, don't resuscitate me. So, you know, he, he was ready to die. You know, we didn't know that at the time, but, you know, if we'd have known that, we'd have said to the nurse, no, we want to keep him, right? But unfortunately, he didn't want to go that way. And also, there's a lot of people who don't want to make a will, most people, you know, didn't, I made a will actually about 20 odd years ago, you know, I haven't changed it recently, but basically, um, you know, people don't want to make a will. Uh, power of attorney, nobody thinks about it until I have a friend who, his, his mother's in hospital just now, well, actually in part of care, home, and, 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 and they're trying to get power of attorney, and, and it's very hard when, when you go to, because you really need the person who um, sadly is, is, is in mind is not there now, that, that they can't confirm that they want uh, their, their relatives. So the point, and you know, the point that Colin was, Colin Keir was making earlier on, at the end of the day, I agree that people who, um, you know, can change their mind, want to change their mind, barness, you know, you know, I totally agree with your point. But there are people out there who do want to die. I wasn't at this committee last week. I was attending a funeral of a family friend who prior to Christmas said to me, and she was in the hospital, she wanted to go home. Medically, she couldn't go home, even though people were there to look after her, but medically she couldn't go home. She said to me personally, I just want to go. Right? And the sadly, she did go, and I attended her funeral last Tuesday morning. Um, so there are people out there who want to go. So why shouldn't we let them go? And, and, I'll, and I'll put that to the witnesses. Dr Hutchinson. Because we live in a society where we relate to each other, can we legislate safely to allow these people who you've described to have that legal right. And my view is, no, we can't, and it hasn't been legislated for safely anywhere else in the world so far. And we have to bear in mind that what does that... that the availability of that for this group of people you're talking about, what does that do for the vast majority of other people in society? I would think that there are numerous things about which we could say there are individuals who wish to be able to do certain things. I wish not to pay the level of tax I pay. I would like, on occasions, to be able to drive down the middle of the road and not on the left. And maybe I should stipulate which road and which time uh, so that you can police that. You would say, you're crazy. Of course you can't do that. 
my rights, my, the availability of things like that for me has to be constrained by the effect on wider society. You said to me, why not let them go? And I would say to you, we do let them go. We do not impose futile treatments on people. And I have had people who, yes, they weren't medically appropriate to go home, but they wanted to go home. That was their home, however messy, sticky, carpeted it was. That was where they wanted to be, and they went home. I facilitated patient, a patient flying back to Africa because he wanted to die on African soil and died shortly afterwards. That's what we do. That's our job, to support people in what they feel that they want. And when they want to let go, to support them letting go. But that's quite different to saying that we are going to change the law to allow people, through medical care, to access lethal drugs with which they can foreshorten their life by months or years, and your background paper is very clear, there will be people who foreshorten their lives by years, and you have no idea what they would have done in those years. And I do have permission from a patient to tell you one story. And he was referred to me in 1991, and the GP said, the only reason I'm referring him is because I cannot give him a lethal overdose. And the I thought his prognosis was three months, as did the oncologist, the surgeon, and his GP. I looked after him. It was not easy. He was very, very difficult. I was at the house the first night till 11 at night. Eleven years later, he phoned me. His wife had been diagnosed with a cancer and was dying. She died, and he was left to bring up the children on his own. He is still alive today, against all odds, and says, Elora, don't go there. What would have happened to my kids? They would have gone into care. And I think you have to remember that we can't all have everything we want in society. We have a duty to provide care. We have a duty to accept death. Mm. Death is an inevitability for everyone. But we don't legislate so that doctors can bring forward in time as part of their so-called clinical treatment, this isn't a treatment, deliberately ending life. I've said already I'm really worried about the interface between Mental Health, Mental Health Act and all the other bits that you have there, where they, they interface. But on grounds of public safety, I don't think that this bill is fit for purpose. I think it is dangerous and wide open and it will lead to confusion, it will lead to people not with malintent, but through not really understanding the issues in depth, deliberately being part of a person's suicide, and people feeling that at that time in their lives their only option is to go for assisted suicide. But in a society in which we're interrelated, that is a step too far and too dangerous. I would concur with that, Laura. I wish I could give a few specific situations, but confidentiality won't let me do that. What I will say is that the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, for example, really states very clearly when I do not need to continue with treatment and when I withdraw treatment. And from my own point of view, I am involved in those decisions with young people where we allow them to go. I think, from my point of view, that's a total different situation than giving them some form of prescribed medication which finishes their life and, and as such I think while there are some strengths within this bill there are areas certainly for young people I have significant doubts on. The Nate. <coughs> yes, I mean, well discussion extremely interesting. Um, I wanted to speak about the people who are totally, utterly incapacitated. People like terminal stages of MND or uh, MS who can absolutely do nothing for themselves and, and suppose this was the law of the land. Um, the, the, the role of facilitators in that and the very, very fine line between assisted suicide and euthanasia and in due course the impact that could have on not only well, the facilitators particularly but on, on other people and I'm interested in any comments around that. I would certainly be very concerned that there's, there's uh, the, the, the latitude uh, in this bill 
uh, and in the whole ethos of assisted dying for, for society which permits assisted suicide to move on to euthanasia and the original sponsor of this bill made it very clear that she saw the two as being the same thing. Uh, and, and I think the, the uh, policy memorandum has made it very clear that she, uh, she had anticipated and the expectation that things would progress to include other groups of patients. You, you cite somebody with motor neuron disease at the very end who can do absolutely nothing for themselves. They can certainly be very frail to be absolutely unable to do anything for themselves. No, I don't. I mean, it would be unusual for them to be so completely incapacitated they couldn't do anything. But certainly that group of people, I, th I think you're raising them because they, they then would need more than the perhaps expected assistance to commit suicide. And where's the line between that and... and ending their lives. What do you do to, to use the words of the policy memorandum, I think, lifting the cup to the patient's lips? You know, can you be sure that when that's happening, the patient hasn't suddenly had a change of mind or whatever? No, you can't. These are unknowables. But it's areas like that which I think make a, a law to enable the deliberate ending of human life so dangerous. Can I just pick up on the wording that you've got in the, in, in the bill before you? In 19b, it is uh, to use the best endeavours to provide the person with comfort and reassurance. Well, reassurance of what? Reassurance that they're doing the right thing? I'm not sure what that reassurance is meant to be. But the other thing is that it doesn't define exactly where the limits of assistance are. What about the person who is on peg feeding? What about the person who might be on intravenous feeding? who can't put the drugs into that bag themselves or who hasn't got the strength to actually take the drugs and pull them down their own peg. So that there isn't a clear definition of what is assistance and what isn't. When I visited Oregon, we had evidence that the, the view was in Oregon that if they couldn't actually take the drug themselves, well, it was too bad. They were no longer eligible. I have a sneaking suspicion from conversations I had outside committee and, and with people that actually that's a blurry line, shall we say. It's difficult and it isn't policed and you don't have a monitoring commission in here to examine after the event exactly what happened and what went on and I would be very worried about it. Dr Jeffrey. Concerned that quite clearly the facilitators are going to be people who are very pro assisted suicide. In fact, the whole thing is going to be administered by people who are pro it. So, who's going to have that voice, that check to say, hang on, I think you're worthwhile, you think there might be another way of doing this? Um, so, I have great concerns about the role of the facilitator. I also have great sympathy for the stresses of that job, if that is what you're doing. Uh, as your work, it's going to be an extremely stressful uh, a job and palliative care have built in in their uh, job support for us that we always have people that we can relate to and talk to and have to have this form of supervision in our work and I hope that if, if this thing does go through that the provision will be made for these facilitators as well because it's going to be very stressful work okay, Thank you Mike McKenzie uh, Thank you, Vinal. Um, I've read a number of accounts of palliative care um, where the whole thing seems to be so high quality and such a rewarding experience that I can hardly wait till I have that experience myself. Um, but I think most of us have had experiences that suggest that that's not strictly speaking true for a proportion of people. And, what I'm interested to, to, to find out in terms of the status quo and understanding the status quo of palliative care, we've heard 40,000 people or so die in Scotland every year. What proportion of these people might um, enjoy the kind of experience that we hear of in the, um, the best case scenario um, of a, you know, things being as good as they might be? And what proportion at the other end of the spectrum um, uh, experience their experience of end of life is is one of suffering, both physical suffering and psychological suffering that would we would all I think agree to be unacceptable. In terms of that, forty thousand people per annum can have some kind of feeling for 
where we are in terms of palliative care and its Mark. effectiveness. Mark. Okay. I, I think I said earlier that there's a, a really urgent need for better data um, about palliative care in all sorts of domains. And I think Richard made the point earlier that the Audit Scotland review of palliative care services in Scotland is, well, it, it's, we're now um, six plus years since publication, and obviously some of the data that was based on was 2006. Um, so there is a need for data characterising the sector. Um, I was going to come in earlier and talk about anticipatory prescribing and the rollout of just-in-case boxes in Scotland, and I was thinking, well, where would I go to give you current data on how far that's progressed. And it's progressed a long way. It's a success story. Uh, but if somebody had come back and said, well, you know, percentage of access for the Scottish population, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I think there's a real need to develop data. Um, and then we've heard about the complexity of palliative care. And yes, there's, there's pain control. Um, we've heard really powerful stories about the importance of um, human relation and spiritual care as well. And and how would we know whether people had, had accessed that? So I think it's a difficult question to answer, but I'm going to have a go. I think it's interesting to look south of the border where there's a systematic uh, survey with really large samples, and they ask bereaved relatives about their reflections. This is a period following death, um, about the reflections that the care and support uh, that their loved one received. And obviously that's not a perfect system. Um, but I think that the bereaved relative um, provides a, a, a unique locus of information about the experience that happened because people nearing the end of life um, typically will move across different settings. Um, so you can run your surveys perhaps in general practice or perhaps on a hospital ward, um, but you'll get part of a picture. Um, so I think that's one, one potential opportunity that we would have in Scotland is to start to ask systematically on a national basis what was it like for your loved one and also for yourself uh, the care that you received in towards the end of that person's life um, and I think if we had that sort of data that we'd be in a much better position to be able to to answer your question at the moment and at the moment um, and others may have a, other ways of trying to answer it I suppose we could look at um, we've talked we've heard about people having a preference to die at home and we've also heard that I think the latest figure, based, the latest data is that 53% of people in Scotland will die in hospital. And I think it's important to say that um, hospital is an appropriate place for some people to be cared for and to, to die at the end of their life. And whilst generally people say that they wish to die at home, if you actually unpack the data, the answers tend to be a bit different for different people. Um, and for example, for um, some of the older population and also interestingly for people who have had experience of caring for a loved one at home they have less strong preferences actually to to die at home as well um, but we can look at the data which tells us the percentage of time that people spent um, at home or in a community setting during the last six months of their life and that gives us an idea of where care is taking place we look we can look at where people die um, so 53% in hospital, 25% at home or in a non-institutional setting, 22% in a care home. Um, relatively small percentages um, in Scotland's hospices, um, but then hospices aren't primarily a place that people go to die. And most of the work that hospices do is about enhancing quality of life and delivered out in the community. So I haven't given you a definitive answer, but I've given you some suggestions about how we might start to answer that question in Scotland. Need. Yeah, I'll just um, reiterate Mark's point uh, about the need for data. We've had um, Quality Improvement Scotland produce palliative care indicators, uh, and to the best of our knowledge, there's been no um, published uh, assessment uh, against those indicators. Um, in England, they have the National Survey of the Bereaved Voices. Uh, we have no such similar survey here in Scotland, and that survey asks bereaved relatives about the care uh, that their loved ones received at end of life. And I think similar information or something similar in Scotland would certainly help. Can I, can I perhaps uh, um, attempt to um, intervene to seek a more honest, uh, more honest answers to the question? Um, I had a friend recently who held a party um, uh, very close to the end of her life, and it might have been described as a very good death. 
Um, I can think easily of nine other people who had deaths that I would not describe in any way as good deaths. Is that proportion nine to one about correct, or am I completely wrong? Can I, I, I mean, it depends what they died of and how old they were and, and what happened. And I mean, I, I, I think, you know, you have to remember that people die in road accidents and they die of complications from illness and they die of infections. And whether you're talking about people dying because they've come to terms with everything that's going on, they've come to terms with their own dying or not, I, I, I really think that it's spurious to try to pluck a figure out the air. But I would also go back to the statement that Mark made earlier, that palliative care is provided by specialist palliative care who are specialist trained, who are there to support the generalist services. So even your question, how many people access palliative care, you have to go and see whether each GP is practicing with a good palliative care approach or whether that individual GP lacks knowledge. And one of the pressures that we have outlined, I think, is that you do need to address the availability of healthcare professionals who have got good core education everywhere if you want to improve the standard of care of people who are dying. And that means having people in A&E well educated in how to managing dying because a lot of people die in A&E and in many other parts of the system and in nursing homes and so on. Yeah, if I could, sorry. I'm proud of healthcare in Scotland. It's not perfect, but I'm proud of the quality of care that I've seen we've been able to provide and the, the testimonials that I've heard from patients who've come from elsewhere and have commended the, what we have here. And I think that we should be looking in a far more wholesome way about how we deal with issues than, than, than proposing assisted suicide. We have the opportunity to affirm that lead that we have in making sure that the level of care we provide for people with a whole range of conditions is brought up to the standard which is currently available for people who suffer from malignancy. Thank you very much. I think you've made that point abundantly clear. I would have preferred that if you asked the question. If I could move on to another area, convener, um, which is um, we heard from uh, Baroness uh, Finlay about a young man suffering from cancer who subsequently recovered. Um, and at, at, at some stage, he was refusing treatment. And we, I think, generally uh, accept that, that patients, people do have a right to refuse treatment, even if that's tantamount to effective suicide. Um, we accept that right. And I'm, I'm struggling, really, to see the difference between um, somebody refusing treatment, where, as a society, we condone the right in fact, it's sacrosanct uh, when, when, even if it is tantamount to effective suicide, and um, us uh, allowing somebody to assist proactively in a suicide. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the distinction. Um, and, and given that we, we, we accept or indeed condone one and not the other, um, I would ask the question in, in medical terms, in clinical terms, um, in, in terms of the public good even uh, or the individual good is the refusal of treatment better in some way than some kind of active suicide process I, I wouldn't put a value judgement on one or the other you, you have to remember that death is going to happen to everybody the issue when someone refuses treatment for whatever reason is that they view that the balance of risks and burdens of that treatment to them outweighs the potential benefit as they see it, as they are dying of their disease, their disease process is carrying on. What you're talking about with this piece of legislation is deliberately foreshortening life before that disease process would be progressing on. And I think what we're saying is that the doctor's duty of care continues right on through while somebody is dying, whether or not they have had a treatment. Because don't forget, some treatments don't work. So people go for treatment, but actually it turns out to be futile. And, and, and 
there was a very good study by Temel and colleagues from the States where people had early palliative care intervention, they had higher quality of life, lower depression scores, but interestingly, they lived longer than those patients with lung cancer who were going through the treatment pathway and didn't have that palliative care intervention. But what you're talking about in this bill isn't about accepting death, isn't about accepting the course of, of treatment or treatment refusal. What you're talking about is deliberately foreshortening life by somebody giving a person lethal drugs to assist their suicide, irrespective of how long that life would have gone on for. We've had some discussion, not necessarily part of the bill, but a principle against the bill that doctors would be involved in this situation where they were shortening people's life. And I think the point that's being made is that if you agree to withholding medicine, you're, you know, the outcome will be shortening that person's life. Yeah, Dr. I think, I think I would just reiterate what Professor Finlay is saying. Um, if I was on a ventilator today and the ventilator was switched off, I would start breathing. If I had advanced cancer, um, my chest was filled with fluid and I could no longer breathe and the intensive specialist realised that continued ventilation was futile, if they stopped the ventilator, those underlying diseases would shorten my life and I would die. So there is a huge difference, a moral difference, uh, a clinical difference between being reasonable and saying these treatments are no, longer fu are no longer beneficial to this person and are therefore futile and we will withdraw, if provided the patient has agreed, and for the patient to choose not to have treatment, it completely alters the situation once you bring in other individuals. Once you've asked for assisted suicide, you are then involving the autonomy of doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. And one of the things we have not actually dealt with today is, it's not just a matter, this isn't just a doctory thing. We work in palliative care as a team. A lot of palliative, most palliative care is done by nurses. How are they going to feel about it? Can you imagine working in a team, the practicalities of working in hospitals, and you all have a clear idea of the sort of way, the sort of pressure hospitals are under in Scotland and in the UK generally today. Can you imagine the pressures of working in that, where one person agrees with assisted suicide, the pharmacist doesn't want to dispense it, the nurse doesn't agree with it? Imagine the disruption to the team that that's going to cause. It's a huge problem. Getting a moral consensus in a team like that might prove very difficult in some of these cases. But I just reiterate, I think there are very clear differences in, in, the, in the situation you came across. And the other thing that you kind of pointed out was sort of saying that we weren't being honest in our responses because we were trying to sort of pretend that all suffering can be relieved. I think one message that we've all tried to get across here is that we have the humility to accept that we cannot relieve all suffering. We realise that. Dr Hutchison has reiterated that several times. There are all sorts of areas in medicine we don't relieve suffering. We don't terminate mothers' lives because they scream to have things ended in the middle of childbirth because their pain is intolerable. We don't do that at that end of life. We stay with people. We do our best to relieve the pain. And I, I think that... Uh, it's spurious to suggest that because we can't relieve all suffering, that it isn't important to do our very best to do as much as we can. And here we are sitting around a table in a country which is rated number one in the world at this, and we don't acknowledge that. I'm reluctant to take people in. I'll be guided by the committee members. Um, we are now at uh, 20 minutes to 12. I uh, have not had the, the, the sponsor of the bill in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm asking for your cooperation to, to bring Patrick Harvey in at this point uh, and give him the opportunity of some time. Um, and, and then we're closing this session. We've got another panel to go and further business in the committee as well. Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much, convener. Um, to be fair, just in relation to the last comment, I don't think I've heard anybody either in this committee session or at any other point in, in the discussion of this bill suggesting that we shouldn't, actually suggesting that we shouldn't give the, the best quality of palliative care that we can. Clearly, some people believe that it's compatible with also 
uh, having the option of assisted suicide, but I don't think anyone has argued that we shouldn't be uh, providing that that uh, that level of care and, and staying with people and giving the, the greatest relief of suffering that we can. I was going to try, Convena, uh, to see if I could identify some common ground uh, between proponents and, and opponents of, of this bill. Uh, given the evidence that we've heard, that might be a tough call. I, I understand that. Uh, but I wonder if... if I could suggest that something we might agree on is that whatever Parliament chooses to do with this bill, to pass it, to reject it, to amend it, um, if it gives uh, a prompt to greater focus of mind and consideration of the issues of palliative care, of the end-of-life uh, situations that people may face, uh, of the uh, health inequalities and the, uh, the need for... Uh, decent, respectful and inclusive treatment uh, of people, uh, that would be something that would be of, of benefit simply through debating uh, this bill. If it encourages a more open uh, and discussive culture uh, in relation to the issue of death, that would be a benefit of even debating this bill. And if the bill was passed, the mechanism of um, preliminary declaration uh, would be one opportunity that I, I would like to hope there might be some common ground about the, the benefit that that mechanism could have, the expectation that any one of us, uh, when we're fit and well, might have a discussion. Uh, it might be normal for us to have a discussion with our doctor uh, and have our general attitude uh, to these issues recorded uh, in our medical records. Is that something that would create uh, some opportunities uh, for a better, more open uh, cultural situation in which we discuss these issues uh, and make our wishes clear. Uh, thank you for that summary, which I, I think is um, very apposite. Uh, yes, we all want to improve care. Yes, these debates are important because they've opened discussion both within the political arena within medicine and within society as a whole and they've raised awareness of dying you talk about your um, schedule one your preliminary declaration if you wish to stick with that I would plead with you to change the wording not of willingness to consider assisted suicide because that makes it sound as whether you're willing or unwilling mm. but actually it's a, a declaration of intent to possibly consider if you're going to leave that determination with the individual otherwise the way it's wording makes it sound as if it's on offer and in terms of a consensus and a way forward yes it is the politicians who make the legislation and the legislative bodies here you are talking about involving another group of people you're talking about involving doctors nurses pharmacists and so on the problem i think is just that the very people that you want to involve are the very people who are saying this is too dangerous i suggested at the outset how the bill could be improved and i did not offer that as any flippant remark and i have many other suggestions as how the bill could be improved and i would willingly share them with you i know we don't have time now but I do honestly feel that if you really wanted to find common ground, you need to consider a system whereby you take it out of medicine so medicine carries on providing care and cares for people in their distress, in their long-term illness, in their dying and the families after death. And you set up a completely separate way that those who are determined to end their life can access lethal drugs without needing to think about getting them off the internet illicitly or go abroad, and that you put in adequate policing of such a process. Any other responses? Uh, did Mr Hazelwood have his hand up uh, a moment ago? It, yes, Mark. It was just really in response to your comment around openness, and I think, I think that is a, something that we've all shared a position on this morning about the value of open discussion to inform and enable people to plan and think ahead. Um, and in Scotland, we have an alliance called Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief, a whole 800 individuals and organizations who are doing all sorts of things to promote that national conversation about death, dying, and bereavement. And then a, a personal reflection, because it's not something we covered in our formal evidence from the partnership. 
And I, it's the question that you asked about whether the early registration, um, uh, early declaration might promote that openness. And I'm not sure because I think you've presented a model which perhaps is true where it's something that people do upstream long before death. And I agree that these sorts of discussions should take place at that early stage because I think they're easier to do there and we, no one knows how long we've got. Um, but I think there's an alternative way of looking at it and I don't know what the answer is, but I think we already see that the discussion around end-of-life issues is absolutely dominated by assisted suicide. And I think it's possible that people might have that discussion and tick the box of the early declaration um, and think that that's job done. And I can see why we would want to do that, because we've heard that end of life can be messy and complicated and difficult, and it requires you to engage with some difficult questions. And I suppose there's a, there's a, the other side of the coin and a possible concern is that people well upstream think they've dealt with it all, but we've heard this morning how people's preferences and perspectives as death becomes more imminent as we all age uh, actually change and it, it might leave people thinking that they've dealt with it all but actually getting to that hospital ward and realizing actually they'd wish they'd learnt a bit more about all this sort of stuff and done the power of attorney um, and had a conversation with the GP about whether should their health deteriorate in this sort of way they even wanted to be admitted into hospital so I'm, I'm not sure about it but I think there are two different ways of looking at it surely is a, a reason why it's a, a, an additional benefit that there's a, a multiple stage process after that. that you, we're not talking about a bill which simply says uh, that a person makes the request, the request is granted and, and there it is done. It, it's, a, it's a more involved process than that. Yes, and I was really just commenting on the fact that well upstream, having ticked the box, people then might be less engaged with wider issues about planning, preparing for the end of life, that's all. And I'm not saying I'm sure that would happen, but I think it's a possibility. And it would be different for different people, I'm sure. You had some comments, Dr. Carter? Yeah. I think that would be very valuable. I think what you, you've set out there would be very good. I, I am um, concerned that we need to almost have this debate by what of, often called in, in palliative medicine double effect. We're getting it unintended. Uh, I would like us to be having it as a primary conversation. And I think it would still be very useful, but I would also want to say at the bill, I still have profound concerns about it being applied to people, for example, under 25. The time for a further yes. question? Uh, thank you. Uh, the, there's been a, a, a range of arguments made, some of which are about practical consequences, uh, the, the risk of uh, someone being subject to coercion, uh, the uh, perception that perhaps... Uh, passing this bill would undermine the political support for palliative care or other other areas which I would categorize as practical consequences there have been other arguments which are raised clearly in terms of principle uh, fundamental principle and I'd just like to explore the, the balance between the two the bill clearly envisages a, a range of circumstances in which people might uh, make a request for assisted suicide if I could invite people to consider what I might call the most clearly end of life end of that range, where someone uh, may well have had access to good quality palliative care. Uh, someone may well have had uh, a long-standing, clearly defined and articulated uh, principle uh, about their attitude to the, the concept of assist assisted suicide. A person may no longer be contemplating other options because their death is imminent. They are dying and that death is, is coming quickly. And they have a clear will to uh, die on their own terms, to say their goodbyes on their own terms at their own time. Is there a clear principled reason why they should not be able to exercise that decision? Or is it entirely a question of practical consequences for society or other people uh, or the risk of coercion? The balance between principle and, and practical consequences. You're back, though, to involving another person in deliberately foreshortening that person's life. And that's a, that is a matter of principle because you have to consider the effect on that person and the system you set up. And your bill, with due respect, isn't about just the very, very, very end of life at all. It's not worded like that at all. And if we... You know, we, we could talk on for hours about theoretical considerations, 
but we've been trying to highlight to you the dangers of this this as I, it's written now I understand and that. ways I'm just that it to could explore be improved. the balance between the principled and the pragmatic arguments well I, th I think there is a public safety issue for for a society you will never have a society in which everybody has everything they want all the time no no but you have to put your boundaries somewhere and I think it was a Nora O'Neill who, who said or perhaps it was Elizabeth Butler Sloss, forgive me, who said that laws are like nation states. They are safer when they rest on clear boundaries. And here what, what you would be doing is fudging that. And you have to think about what Lord Carlyle determined, uh, named the collateral damage. And I think our concern is about potential. Certainly my concern, I can't speak for others, is, that, is about the public safety and who will get caught up, and how you will ensure that people don't get caught up. And it was Lord Faulkner on the Today programme who admitted that there will be mistakes and no, no legislation is watertight, and that worries me, because once somebody's dead, they can't come back again. Uh, George has referred to this as the Rubicon, and that we stand on one side of the Rubicon, and we can cross the Rubicon into this other world. And doctors... Uh, by their professional oath, um, stay on the side to know that they can't kill patients. We're confident in that. And that enables us to, in all sorts of ways, not just in these difficult conversations, it enables us to feel confident in using large doses of drugs when they're necessary to combat pain. We feel confident in that. We are protected by the law. A funny thing, when someone heard I was coming here to give evidence, a friend of mine who has a completely opposite view from me, still remains a friend, said, I really agree with assisted suicide, but I wouldn't want to be looked after by a doctor who did. And that kind of encapsulates the sort of dynamic here. We want doctors who are on our side and will care for us and will say, hang on a minute, you know, is this the right thing? That, that kind of encapsulates it for me. Anyone else? Patrick? I, th I think right. those are the issues I wanted to explore. Thank you. It remains for me then to thank you all for your attendance, the evidence that was provided in written forum and um, your, your, your evidence here this morning. Uh, thank you all very much. My apologies to committee members Richard Lyle and Richard Simpson for not getting them back in. Um, but uh, thank you all uh, again. We need to quickly turn round now for our next panel.
We now, uh, <coughs> thank you. We now reconvene uh, and continue with agenda item number one, uh, scrutiny of the assisted suicide Scotland bill. And <coughs> um, <coughs> we, we we now move to our second round table of the morning with uh, religious and faith groups. Um, we're sorry that we're, we're you know a bit behind schedule, but I'm. I'm sure that you all found that session as interesting as I did. And, uh, so we, as we normally do with a panel, we just go around the table, introduce ourselves, and then we'll go on to our first question, which I think is with, from Dennis uh, Robertson. Uh, we have with us today Dr Mary Neill, who, who, who is a committee advisor on this issue. Uh, my name is Duncan McNeill. I'm the MSP for Gilton and Verclyde and convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, my name is Bob Doris. I'm Deputy Leader <coughs> of the Health and Sport Committee and I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow. Good morning. I'm Sally Foster Fulton. I'm the convener for the Church and Society Council for the Church of Scotland. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands MSP. Howard Harris, convener of Doctrine Committee with the Scottish Episcopal Church. And uh, good morning, because I think we're just there. Uh, I'm Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeen West. I'll have to say good afternoon, <laughs> well, since we've crossed the Rubicon. <laughs> Ephraim Borowski, Scottish Council of Jewish Communities. Good afternoon, uh, Colin Keir, Edinburgh Western Constituency. Donald MacDonald, uh, representing the Free Church of Scotland. Mike McKenzie, MSP, Highlands and Islands Region. Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Uh, Salah Biltegi, representing the Muslim Council of Scotland. Good afternoon, Richard Lyle, MSP's Central Region. Hello, I'm John Deegan. I'm the Parliamentary Officer for the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Scotland. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP, um, Mid-Scotland and Fife. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Bill. Patrick. Patrick. <laughs> Member in charge of the bill. It's just yeah. because I'm so quiet. So I know. know. You, you are quiet. And I'm, I'm, you know, given the previous session, my, my view has always been at this side of you, but, you know, so a, but you, feel free to bring me back into central focus here. But Dennis, uh, Dennis Robertson is going to ask the first question, and then we'll see what responses take us, and we'll have other questions as we go on. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, and thank you, convener. Uh, in many of the submissions we've received, um, sanctity of life se seems to be quite prominent in a lot of the submissions. And I wonder if we could maybe explore with you um, what is meant by that sanctity of life. And, and if, if there is any situation that you would in, ever envisage that uh, assisting someone to take suicide would be totally against that, or would you see maybe being respectful of the sanctity of life? Any takers? Bill. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Bill Yeah, thank you. Salah uh, It's not Doctor of Medicine, by the way, just in case. Uh, well, I actually am not a scholar in, 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 uh, in Islam, so I had a gathering of Imam uh, scholars and asked them, is there any situation where the sanctity of life as we know it can be relaxed or can do something about it? And they very clearly and very openly said, no, there is no excuse for changing the time of death. We can't change it anyway, but there is no uh, permission at all to interfere with uh, life. Of course, there are situations which are like legal and so on, but that's a different story. Reverend MacDonald. Yes, we believe the sanctity of sanctity of life rests on the fact that we believe that we are made in God's image. In other words, that we are different from the animals, that we are there's a spiritual uh, dimension to our beings, which uh, makes it different for us. And we have a responsibility not just to maintain our own lives, but to maintain the lives of others, to respect their lives, and to uh, care for one another uh, throughout our, our lives. Now, you might notice that we have in our submission we have said that we have no right to deliberately end an innocent human life. You know, there may be other debatable things like just war and things like that. But leaving that aside at the moment, we're dealing with uh, people uh, who are going to die anyway. They are facing uh, problems because of suffering and uh, they want help to end their lives. 
Now, uh, the best way, I think, that we believe to respect a person's life is to help them to face up to life, to relieve the suffering, and to show compassion. Now, we believe that compassion uh, means that we feel with them in their situation, we understand them, we go alongside with them, suffer alongside them, if possible, to some extent, and relieve that suffering and prepare them for their death. And, as Christians, we believe there is life beyond death, for which we would point them as well. But uh, the, this, the, the question of, of sanctity of life, if you don't believe in God, if you just believe, say, in a materialistic view of the universe, that all we are is matter, then you have to account in some way for the, the importance that we give to human life. We all realize that we are different. We have responsibility. We have a, a creation, a creational and, uh, gifts, uh, aesthetic gifts, all of these things. And because of that, we know we're different. And you have to find some way then of, of giving importance to our lives. And some people say it's autonomy. You know, I will make my own decision. I will make my own life. And that is, I think, why many people then go on and say, because it is my life and I've, I find that I make my own uh, meaning to life, then I want to have control over my death as well. Whereas those of us who come from a faith perspective say, you know, God has given us life and God will take away the life. We are responsible <coughs> while we're here to maintain that life and to help others to maintain it in, in the best way possible. So we believe there is never uh, a reason, a good and sufficient reason, for ending someone's life, even if they themselves want to end it. They are free to do so. It's not something that we would encourage. Uh, but uh, if, if, on the other hand, the, from a medical point of view, and I, for 20 years I was a doctor and surgeon, the person says that they want, don't want to go on living and they'll refuse treatment of all kinds, they might even refuse food and water, then we would still support them through that. That is their autonomy. But they have no right, we believe, to demand that we, as their helper or as their carer or as their doctor, actually deliberately help to end their lives. So sanctity of life, yes, is extremely important, but it must also be taken into consideration with uh, personal autonomy and uh, human <coughs> dignity. Thank you for asking the question. <clears throat> Sanctity of life is not exclusive to those around this table who hold to a religious faith. Sanctity of life means the set aside,ness the specialness of life, that fleeting, fragile, extraordinary experience that we share. But share is the word that I'd like us to take a minute and focus on. It may be my life, but I share that life with others, and that's what makes it special and sacred. The thing that concerns us about this bill stems from the same for the folk who support it. It starts with dignity and dependence and how we see those two things interrelate and human rights and compassion. Everyone is dependent, and that does not take away dignity. In fact, actually, that enhances it. And anything that erodes that idea that if you are dependent or at times place your burdens down so that others can help you carry them, that that's a loss of dignity or a loss of your humanity or a loss of the sacredness of your life, then we all need to be concerned. And that's our concern about this bill, especially for those who find themselves vulnerable, marginalized, afraid, coming to the end of their life, to say to them, your life is somehow less worthwhile than somebody who is healthy and fit and coherent and cognizant and also being able to be eloquent. That erodes everybody. So the sanctity of life is very complex, and it's not a stark black and white thou shalt not. It's how is this decision about my life going to impact the others that I share my life and this planet with? And I think that's where we really need to grapple with this. That's where our concerns lie, essentially. Thank you. Mr. Bernanke. And, and um, I'd like to answer Derek, Dennis Robertson's question by referring to the question that Patrick Harvey asked right at the end of the previous session, um, where he drew the distinction between issues of principle and mere practical questions. 
um, because I think that's a false dichotomy. I think if there are sufficiently many practical questions about absolutely every aspect of what is proposed, then it becomes an issue of principle. It's not just a matter of knowing when the proposed criteria might be satisfied, but it's a question of knowing how we could know that those criteria are satisfied. Uh, and that seems to me to be at least at the heart of legislating about these issues, because this isn't theology, this is law. And law is in the practical domain. And it's therefore all these practical questions that this committee and the Parliament itself has to address in considering this bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that both within faith context and without faith context, paths can be chosen that where it's known that death is likely to be involved, whether it's difficult decisions to go to war or to stand in the way of a careering bus that's going to hit somebody else or <coughs> go ahead with a pregnancy that might well end, end your life. I think what feels different about assisted suicide is that it feels like death chosen for the sake of death rather than um, death might well come, but it's for the sake of life. I think that's what makes the difference for it, that it's death chosen for its own sake rather than um, death perhaps being embraced because it's going to lead, it's going to issue in life elsewhere or for others. Anyone else? John, you get... Yeah, I, I concur with all the, the previous answers. I, th I think that the... Uh, the the hub of the, the argument, I suppose, is, is the difference between uh, recognising the inalienable right to life that, that all of us have um, and seeing that as the foundation to make sure that everyone in our society is always safe and the, the point beyond which we cannot go is that where we deliberately hasten death, where we choose death as, uh, as the outcome. I, I think you're right to uh, point out that we should respect the autonomy of individuals, support them, in their autonomy as, as far as we can, but in the context of having a safe society where that uh, human dignity is always upheld. Uh, accepting death um, is, is a natural part of life, uh, and I think that doesn't breach a uh, sanctity of life or a recognition of the fundamental human right to life. Anyone else? Can, can yes, please. I mean, an abrupt uh, short statement, really. Uh, but we, we're not just talking about the bill from that theological point, which is valid to us anyway, but from the point is that is there a reason that we break that rule for benefiting the society in any way? And when I looked at the bill and other people looked at it, uh, we found that it will do a lot of things which is not in the benefit of the society as a whole. Uh, will be creating mistrust between the medical profession and the uh, general public. It will create a culture of suicide is one option of ending, of treatment of any person. And if that's an option, that will be a very attractive one to many young people, especially who are in depression or in any cases in a very bad way. Uh, there was a case recently in, in Belgium where they actually moved, as this bill postulates, from uh, assistance to uh, euthanasia. Uh, and this was someone who was in jail for life, and he asked it to have assisted suicide, and he was granted this. Uh, and then, you know, there was action from the communities, and the Minister of Justice uh, reversed that decision uh, because. There was an interesting thing here. Is it uh, uh, ending life? Is that a punishment or a treatment? Is that his benefit or benefit of society or not? So that, that, that's something which could come and they reach this stage. The, the important thing for us is really how it affects the behavior of the society. And the main ones, I think, is this culture of suicide becomes a normal part of treatment and also the mistrust between the patient the medical profession, the family, and we heard about the burden on the family, and that's a real feeling for someone who is in a difficult situation. So we have to consider all these things and uh, look at it. In fact, the whole bill really is not uh, sort of tight from beginning to end, if you go to the practical points, maybe these come other questions. But from the beginning, there is no advice and consultation given to the person before he decides that he wants to be assisted. 
if we go to any transaction in our life or any process in our life, we ask a legal expert, financial expert, even a car mechanic, but in this end of life, it just say, puts it in the hands of the person. You decide that you want to end your life, and then everything falls from on. So that's the, from the beginning. In move forward, we find that there is no monitoring process for the for the procedure at all. It's just this sign, sign this paper, this, this, and there's no monitoring. There's no follow up. There's no way that we can make sure that uh, things could go wrong. And I'm reminded of something which I've been involved in, uh, the, the, the certification of death generally, and there's a new law which came two years ago. I was involved in discussions for some years now, and it's all based on one person, who's Dr. Chipman, who was trusted by his people, but he's killed so many of them. Mm -hmm. So that's in just certification of death. Of course, he was killing them. But if you have this kind of bill and you have this group which is called facilitators, which we don't know whether they are medical people or normal people or what, and give them the, again the, the way to this yeah. without any monitoring or any follow-up, it seems very, very strange. So we're not just crossing a principle, but we're going from a principle to a sort of open system which uh, nobody can say it's tight enough, and uh, the quote I was going to mention was mentioned earlier, uh, Lord Faulkner himself said those no safeguards no safeguards are watertight. And this is not anything which we can repair if it goes wrong. I think this is why we stopped capital punishment, because we thought that this is something, if it happens, we can't correct it. And that's, in a way, similar. Dennis? Yeah. Uh, just, uh, there's a couple of points that uh, uh, we've heard um, uh, compassion uh, and, and suffering, we've heard um, sharing. And I'm just wondering, you know, at some point, would we accept that the person uh, and their family have have <coughs> mutually come to this decision uh, because the family is respecting the will of the individual and they're accepting that they don't want the person perhaps to, to, to suffer any longer and the person's made that clear themselves and their compassion is to agree is it not then right that that person should be facilitated towards that end of life? Mr Deacon. The problem we, we have is that that choice of that individual, uh, albeit um, it may be a sincere belief that they're better off dead, it impacts on, it, it creates a universal categorisation of human beings in our society, that there are some that the law enshrines that are right and we endorse that they're choosing that they're better off dead. I think that's the protection we have to take into mind. And I think we also have to take into mind that uh, the advances in medicine and technology now uh, afford us the opportunity to give care better than we ever have at any time in our lives. So it, it maybe uh, should make us think about why um, why are people at this very time in history wanting to, to, to choose to die? I think that's uh, an existential question that, that perhaps needs addressed as well. But part of that will be uh, a breakdown in the bonds that we have in society. And I think it's when you have that breakdown of bonds and you feel isolated and you feel you're not worth anything, you don't mean anything to anyone else, you're more liable to feel that you want to die. And I think what assisted suicide does is it puts a, 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 a finality to that decision that, yes, we are breaking all of our bonds with you and you're breaking all of your bonds with society. And I think that's something that we, we cannot do. Yes, I think we've heard in the last um, in the last series of of people giving evidence, we heard compelling stories in support of assisted suicide and compelling stories against. There are stories on either side, but compelling stories do not make good, safe legislation. And I think we need to distinguish between that. There. I don't believe, and a lot of the evidence that we've been hearing from the people who work day to day, are we cannot safeguard the slow erosion of the understanding of the dignity and the worth of human life. We cannot safeguard the most vulnerable, the old person in a home who feels that he or she is spending all her children's or his children's inheritance, and it would be a really good 
honorable thing to agree to assisted suicide for all these good reasons, but they don't want to go. There is no way to safeguard against that. And it's not intentional pressure from families. It can be internal pressure from themselves. We can't safeguard. But when we say that there are times when one set of circumstances means that your life or that type of life might not be worth living. You plant a seed and you begin to change things. You have walked from one way of looking at things to another, and it's very difficult then to walk back. Once that legislative genie is out of the bottle, you can't get it back in. Somebody else, and, and then uh, Reverend Arnott. Yes, please. I support that. I think the premise of the question is that it's, in a sense, compassionate always to say yes. But we all know that it's not compassionate to children always to say yes when they say they want something. Uh, and the same may well be true at the other end of life as well. Um, let me make this point as well. Today is, as everybody knows, Holocaust Memorial Day. Um, it's now a well-known cliché that the Holocaust didn't begin in Auschwitz, it ended in Auschwitz. Uh, but that is, again, a point to make the distinction that Patrick Harvey made, a point about practicalities rather than principles. In terms of principle, it began with the belief that some lives are not worth as much as others. And that is precisely what we're faced with here, and that's the point that Sally has just made as well. Anyway, yes, sorry, um, uh, Reverend Harris and then Reverend McDonald. Thanks very much. I think that we do always have to give full recognition to uh, the decisions people have reached and, and fully hear them out on, on their assessment of their situation, how they're feeling, how their relatives are feeling. So, yes, I think if people have, as, as a family unit, perhaps, or like more extended grouping, um, come to the decision, we have to give full recognition to that it doesn't necessarily follow that we say that that route is possible for you but actually to allow that to be said and to be recognized brings a kind of healing and opens up you know other other possibilities as does for example when people say i feel like i'm a burden mm -hmm. to some extent it's actually valuable to acknowledge that and and it might be helpful and might relieve anxiety if family members say uh, yeah, you are a burden. Uh, actually, you are a burden, but you're a burden that we want to carry and we don't want to not carry you. Um, or for people to say, I want to end my life, and you let them explore that fantasy. As you do, it's not the same, but as you might with a sibling who says, I hate my sister, I want to kill her, and you say, okay, <laughs> well, tell me a bit more about that. Then. <laughs> you know. Um, but actually, I don't mean to trivialise at all, because when people have been allowed to say that, and they've, they've been able to go that far. They've, 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 let them ex they've let themselves explore that in conversation and they've, and they've then pulled back from it. So I do think it's really important to, to give full recognition when people reach that decision. Um, let them explore it. Um, doesn't mean necessarily that we should allow that in law, but to let them explore it can actually address some of the issues and they pull back from wanting to go that far. Reverend MacDonald. Another point, I think, about that when somebody says, oh, I, I, I want to end it all now, and the family thinks, oh, yes, he's suffering terribly, he should go now. Uh, I mean, obviously, that's a case where there should be further consultation, especially palliative care consultation, with its you know, all-round holistic uh, means of treating, so that you know, they probably would change their minds after some time. So you know, we shouldn't just take the first declaration that... that I want to end my life as, as that's their fixed, fixed will by any means. And the other thing is that if you look at the figures, say, from Oregon, where it's been going for some years now, the, the, by far the biggest reason given for taking the death under the Death with Dignity Act is loss of autonomy, loss of independence, uh, loss of enjoyment in their usual activities, etc. It's not unbearable pain, that's very far down in the list. Being a burden to others is perhaps in the middle of the list. But it's, it's usually the, the kind of person, strong person, who just hates being dependent on others, who is, uh, he wants to keep control, he or she, control of his or her life, uh, and he wants to say, 
no, I want to end it, and I want to end it on my terms. And um, you know, it's so that you know, proponents of the bill often uh, say it's the unbearable suffering, in other words, the the pain that can't be controlled. And there's a very small percentage, perhaps, of people for whom that is true. But there are other means of doing it uh, with the holistic care and uh, sedation, as well as pain relief, etc. But it's it's not generally speaking that unbearable pain for which we, of course, have. You know, we, we must feel along with them as well. But it's, it's, it's really it's the loss of control, the loss of, a, uh, of independence that is the, is the main reason why people persist in, in seeking uh, assisted suicide. And that, I think, is, is not an adequate reason for changing the law, which is there to protect the vulnerable at the moment. You know, we heard in the evidence earlier this distinction about assisted suicide or... Um, the withdrawal of treatment for an illness um, uh, on request. Do you see a distinction there? Uh, as I said earlier, we will all die, and sometimes uh, we do recognise that if a person is suffering, sometimes dying is, is a relief for them, and it's a re relief for the families as well. But what we try and do is support them in the lives that they have, you know, alleviate pain as best we can. And sometimes that means that you weigh up that this particular treatment is not worth the effort. It's too burdensome to the individual. And so to, to forgo that treatment is, is completely um, uh, in line with a recognition that this, this person has an inalienable dignity and we're just going to make sure that they see the way out of this life as comfortably as possible. But it brings on the death earlier. No, it's accepting death. I mean, I think now we have right. the capacity, and this perhaps is a fear... Uh, that motivates some who are for assisted suicide is that there is sometimes um, an endeavour that is not worth the, the, the effort that puts people under further suffering that they, they, they don't need. And I mean, it's called vitalism, where any effort to keep alive is pursued simply because people think that uh, le life, whether it's, uh, it's lived through suffering, just has to be kept there. Uh, that, that's... that's um, a misunderstanding and perhaps it, it needs to be teased out in the minds of people that accepting that I don't want to take any further treatment is, is, is a completely uh, licit, uh, legally and morally uh, approach to take. Anyone else? Oh, yes, please. I think this is, goes to the understanding of us as families, you can call it part of it is compassion and so on, but the uh, question of dignity and dying with dignity I think if someone is really suffering much, the dignity is to see himself or herself looked after and seen by uh, his family, uh, children, girlchild, etc. That is dignity, I think. But to just leave them alone, to would you like we we, we finish it? That that's not really dignity, because having this cycle between the father, the grandfather, and then the children and so on. And it's, it's a complete cycle. We should look after our parents as much as they have looked at us. It's not just they have uh, you know, brought us to go to university and just forget about us, and we forget about them. Th this is what you know, human beings should be. Uh, well, in even the animal world, it happens sometimes. So when looking at how we live as human beings in this way, not just as commodities, as someone would say, and really having the, the compassion of the family and the friends and coming to see you, that makes a change. And we had lots of examples about this. And the other thing is nobody knows exactly when death will happen. Even if we do assisted suicide, it might not work. <laughs> so why put ourselves in something which is not definitely you known? Nobody knows exactly what will happen. And in many cases, there will be failures. And the statistics actually from Oregon shows that about 50% of the people who had been prescribed the, med the, the, the medicine to die or poison have not used it. So people can change their mind very, very quickly in this. And that could be because things around them have changed. Maybe people who want them when they saw them want to die have changed their attitude towards them. So it's, it's this human feeling together. Uh, we should not say that forget it, we can have... Uh, a better way or an easy way. And the other thing which is always happened, I think, the person 
when he is nearly dying, whether he's healthy or not, knows that this is the end. And he can decide without poison, without anything, that this is it and that's finished. And I've seen this in, in, in many cases. So why do we have to interfere in something which is going to happen anyway? Please. A profound and distinct difference in assisted suicide and making an informed and supported decision not to have treatment that can be at times incredibly invasive and have a profound impact on the quality of the life that you have left, i.e., I have terminal cancer. There are things that can impact the length of my life, but it's going to take away from the quality of my life. And on balance, I have made an informed decision with my physicians and my family that that treatment is going to impact negatively the quality of my life while it might increase the quantity. That's very different from saying at a determined time, I am going to take a lethal dose, dose of medication that will end my life. And that's a proactive move to end rather than take advantage of the most of your life that you've got left. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Convener. I was interested just in exploring this idea of the sanctity of life and the, and the, 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 the concordant idea that that's always got a constant value. In as much as um, we're all aware of deaths that we talk of as being particularly tragic, maybe a child, maybe a young mother, and on the other end of the spectrum, maybe somebody who's very elderly, having lived a fulfilling, rewarding life and dying peacefully in their sleep. Um, so it seems to me that at, at, at one level at least we do um, confer a differing value on the lives and on death. Um, and I just wondered what the witness felt. that is this a constant that remains constant throughout our lives or is it that value subject to change? I would make a distinction... Uh, which I think is not being made in the question between two different senses of the word life. When you evaluate lives in the way in which you have somebody's unfulfilled potential, someone who has achieved a lot, you are evaluating their life in the sense of their passage through this world from birth to death. When we talk about the um, infinite value of human life, we're talking about the state of being alive. And that, I think, is a distinction which needs to be kept in mind, uh, which, if I may say so, the question elided. Thank you. One yes, please. Thank you. I, th I think that your, the two examples you gave don't contradict uh, one another, in that if, you're, if somebody has lived a full life, then you don't regard their death as a tragedy. It might be sad news, but it's not bad news necessarily. Uh, and what you're valuing is, is the culmination of a very full life. And when somebody's life is cut short in a way that seems sort of unnaturally short, a child or, or a mother of, of young children, then the tragedy in that is that their life hasn't had that fullness to it. So they're consistent, they're consistent with one another. Those, those contrary reactions are um, both consistently <coughs> testifying to a, to a valuing of the sanctity of life. That's fine. Um, I think in, in every life and all through your life, there are times when things are really good and there are times when things are really challenging. And that does, that's with every life, whether it's at the end of your life, at the beginning, or somewhere in the middle. So I think it's about how people walk with you during all the times of your life, good and bad. So I think, yes, there's always qualitative. I would say that, you know, there are times in my life when things were really, really hard. And looking back on them, it was how people walked with me that defined the difference. Um, again, there are unexpected joys and unexpected pains in every life. Um, one of the things that concerns me about assisted suicide is you're curtailing any unexpected joys. You are making a decision to end your life. And the unexpected joys that may come that we never know about may not happen. Mike, you... you, you okay? Yeah, right, you okay for, for that, okay, for those okay. answers, it's... Uh... Colin. Colin Keir. Thanks, convener. Just been changing my question a little bit um, on the back of what I said there. Um, it's actually um, it's something we said earlier on, since uh, Mr. Dean there. Um, I do beg your pardon. Uh, for, um, I, and it's about the acceptance of death. 
and the, the fact that um, you know we're helping to curtail, or someone will be asked to help someone to curtail their life, because let's face it, suicide is not uh, it's not illegal um, as such. Um, and my question really is, given the fact that we have those who are, for whatever reason, go out and commit suicide, my, my concern by someone who's seriously considering this course of action through the end of a seriously bad uh, illness, um, they are really having problems, we're getting to end of life, and there are, if they are, though that small amount of people, as I believe it is a small amount of people, who perhaps think, I am definitely, I'm at the end of my tether, I want to end this, I will end this. And is it fair on us to deprive them of some help or possibly the fact that they head in their own direction and they take their own lives in a not as pleasant manner? shall we say, and they end up in a situation that is um, quite harrowing for the families particularly. Would it not be better for the families if um, the issue was resolved properly beforehand, there would be an acceptance that this is going to happen, as against suddenly finding that the nearest and dearest or a family or friend has taken their own life in some degree of solitude and in a position that is not quite as um, pleasant. I, I think the thing about suicides are, are that they are a tragedy. You know, it's people who are who are who are desperate, and what I think we have to offer is some help and stand by them when when they are desperate. That's why we have suicide prevention uh, measures supported by the, the Scottish government and and many other charities. Um, I think the issue of, of bereavement is, is, is huge. We heard, we heard about that earlier, and I, I, I don't think we're going to be helped by the fact that a person chooses to end their own life with the, the, the help of a doctor. In fact, I, I think the problem raised is that um, it undermines the foundation of the, our laws that protect all of us, that ensure there is no discrimination against uh, certain people because we think that they're of less worth uh, than others. So. By all means, let, let's support people, but to, to uh, hasten their death, I, I think, in, in no way helps um, them. Um, I think we are capable of trying to give support as, as far as we can and support the families to, to ensure that they do not go through, or they have as good a, a death as possible. I think we had one of the, the, the initiatives this morning, is good life, good death, um, uh, good life, I forget the full name of it, good life and a uh, good death, good good grief. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, th I think for, to allow people to do that naturally and accepting death and supporting them as best we can, there is a, there's a deep instinct within every human being and every culture of self-preservation. And in the past, you, you may have said that suicide is not illegal, but I wouldn't say it's lawful. If you, if you look at some of the, the debates around when Westminster, I know it was for England and Wales, but when they talked about this, they thought people who want to die actually have some sort of problem. There's some level of depression or, or desperation in their, li their lives. What They do not need to be prosecuted after attempting suicide. I think that's where the, the Suicide Act in 61 was introduced. It was out of compassion that they decided not to prosecute. And that's why assisted suicide had a, a penalty of 14 years, almost the same as um, uh, murder. Um, so I, th I, th I think recognising that suicide is a tragedy and we try and help people through their lives to have as full a life as possible and not end in a desperate situation where um, they feel they have to sever all their bonds with society and with their family. Yeah, sorry. Um, Donald. Can I just pick up on something <coughs> that John Deegan said uh, about depression, about the incidence of depression uh, in those who are suicidal? And we know that that's very common, say, in young people young men in Scotland, for instance, it's, uh, and that's why we have a, you know, an anti-suicide strategy. And it's the same towards the end of life. People who are in terminal illness often are depressed. And it's often quite difficult uh, to reach that diagnosis, I think, from a medical perspective. This is where you have got to have you know, a specialist uh, examination of such patients. 
And again, I think it bothers me in the practical aspect of the bill is that there's no uh, necessity for having this kind of psychological or psychiatric assessment uh, of the, the person who asks for assisted suicide. So, yes, um, uh, towards the end of life, many people will, will get depressed and perhaps people don't recognize it. The family mightn't even recognize it because they put down the, their kind of withdrawn state or their, their refusal to sort of face the future, uh, put it down to the actual suffering, the physical pain, the weakness, etc. Now that is part of it, obviously, but when the, uh, when the mind actually gets depressed, then it affects the whole of their, of their system. And, you know, with proper uh, help, and psychiatric help and, of course, antidepressants probably, uh, they can be got through that and then perhaps prepared for a better death than just being you know, put to sleep uh, by their own action. Yes, please. I think it's important that we return to the idea that this is law that we're talking about and any time something is legislated for or against what you've got to do, it's about a balance between the benefits and the drawbacks for an individual and the benefits and the drawbacks for society. So what about all those people who want, who aren't articulate, who are not well supported, who are vulnerable, but who desperately want to live with dignity until they die? I think that's, that's where we have to, to focus that. And any time you begin to erode the level of, of support for them, even in, even in society and, and the way that they're perceived, then, then you're on a dangerous path. I also wanted to go back to some of the talk that was going on in, in the last panel about palliative care. We have a great system of palliative care in the United Kingdom, but it is not perfect and it is patchy. Um, if you have a non-malignant disease, um, your chances of having good palliative care are less. Before we move to a plan B, why not exhaust plan A and do absolutely everything we can to ensure that good, consistent, deep palliative care is offered throughout Scotland? I think until we have exhausted that and can put our hands up and say, we've done absolutely everything we can do in regards to palliative care, then why move to plan B? I should, I should point out for those who sat through earlier this morning and, <clears throat> um, and are here, here now that uh, we have been involved in a number of areas here. Assisted suicide bill is one of them. Access to new medicines, uh, which is another aspect of, of all of this. And we do intend uh, in, the, in, in the new year to look at uh, palliative care and uh, end of life. So uh, you know, we are trying to, as a committee, see this in, the, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a broader in a broader set, uh, setting, so we we put that on the record <laughs> this morning. Yes, sir. A uh, couple of just small points in this. One is assisted <coughs> suicide, to me, actually, not involving one person only doing something awful by killing himself, which is suicide, which I don't agree with. It's also involving someone else to do the process. And this will have very difficult uh, repercussions if something like this goes ahead because you will have to try to find a way that you don't discriminate against doctors and medical people who don't agree with this and go into this. And we know that although there is usually some conscious uh, 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 clause, it doesn't always work that easy. So this is another addition to the difficulties. Uh, going back to palliative care, uh, what I know is that uh, it's not really completely funded by government like NHS, for example. Uh, a lot of it, it depends on charities and so on. So why not put some you know, support into, into this? And that's something which is uh, to be looked at more than, than anything else, really. Um, this line. Thank you. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kinzina. I'm, I'm very impressed with the... Um, the amount of uh, churches and faiths we have here this morning, and, and I, I respect you all, uh, but I also have to ask the question. Um, we all know when, when we were born. We can all say, you know, the day we were born, none of us know when we're going to die. No one can predict when they're going to die. And, and the last panel basically went on about the fact that uh, to give more days and more years. Now, I, I know a friend of mine's mother was told she had cancer. She had only six months to live, and she actually lived three years. We all visit our relatives, sadly, who have gone in cemeteries. We only need to go to local cemeteries and see the flowers and the respect and everything that everyone go, goes. But the point I have to say is, I have never heard so many scare stories this morning 
about you know um, we should we, we should let these people uh, go on and we shouldn't let them die and, and all this and, and all the different other things you know because no one wants their relatives to go we all want to keep them as I said in the previous panel but if a relative wants to go why shouldn't we let them go and that's the point I want to make and want to ask and I know the answers I'm going to get but but basically but basically why shouldn't if someone is someone is dying and they're lying there and they've said to you before you know the, the, <coughs> the, the sort of lie and we all went into hospices and we went into hospitals and we've all um, you know went in and seen our friends etc relations and they've said I want to go why shouldn't we let them go or, or even help them go. I'm sure we'll get some responses from that. Yes, of course, but jo uh, uh, John Deegan. Well, I, th I think you heard some scare stories because there is something to be scared of. Uh, it's been, it's, it's, since the Second World War, it's been secular authorities that have created a human rights regime that's put um, the right to life as the foundation for all other rights. And um, that has been increasingly recognised with more positive obligations on states to ensure that people do realise the right to life. So, um, that, that was founded on recognising how dark things get when people are, have that power, that they can decide over life and death, and how easily that is abused. But not, not only can it, uh, it just be abused, and we can recognise that directly, perhaps after it's happened, but also it degrades this fundamental recognition that every human life is, is special and to be nurtured and to be to be protected as much as possible. But thirdly, it also leads to temptations which which undermine everyone's right to life. You know, we've already seen in other jurisdictions people being refused treatment because caring for them was too expensive or it was cheaper just to give them a concoction that would kill them. We've heard of uh, jurisdictions where people found out that their, their Tom Morty in Belgium, for example, his elderly mother, who was suffering dementia, he got a phone call to say your mother has been has been put to death yesterday. He knew nothing about it. We've heard of Kate Cheney, a case in Oregon, where sh her daughter was coaching her what to say so that she could get assisted suicide. And this was recognised by a doctor, but she was just the family were able to take it out and find another doctor who had a life um, put to an end. We've now seen the development of this, where people are, are nominating themselves for death in Switzerland just because they're tired of living. We, we had the case this morning about the, the people, go, the twins going blind who wanted to die. We've seen the extension of it now in, in Holland and in Belgium now, where children um, now can be put to death. And that's why you're hearing scare stories, because it's something to be scared about when you take away a foundation that's been recognised through our, our, our religious traditions that are, are testifying to that as well, but also our, our secular institutions have tried to uphold this because it's very dangerous to take that platform away. Yes, please. And then um, I'm not going to justify scare stories. I'm going to address the question again. Um, and it seems to me that the question that Richard Lyle has asked is one that would have been appropriate had we today been discussing making suicide illegal or making it illegal to strive officiously to keep alive. That's not the question that's before us. The question before us is about assisting suicide. In other words, the boundary that is being crossed here by this proposed legislation is not to do with people dying, but to do with what their agents do. And that is what we heard loudly and clearly from the medical profession at the previous panel. And to some extent, it's language again. We're calling this assisted suicide. We might just as well refer to it as requested euthanasia. And then I don't think it would have quite so many supporters. Reverend MacDonald, to see This is what I said before this question, that you are involving someone else in the act. Yeah. But those who commit suicide, we don't stop them. If anyone say, I'm not having any medicine anymore, nobody stops them. Reverend MacDonald, and then... Yeah. I think the, the question mentioned, you know, why keep people alive when they don't want to? Now, uh, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding among, amongst people, especially the people who are well at the moment. And I've heard people say, I have heard a good Christian man say, a member of the church saying, oh, when my time comes, I just want to let me go. Don't keep me alive unnecessarily. Well, nobody would, I hope. 
you know, people seem to think that doctors nowadays, because they're so specialised and they're so keen on doing experiments, that they just keep people alive and alive and alive, you know, when they, when they don't have to. Uh, and I, that's a complete misunderstanding, because when a person does come to that level, when they're ill, <clears throat> and perhaps their life is at risk, they want treatment, they don't want to die. It's only later on, perhaps, when they realise the end is coming, that they might say, oh, well, just end it now. But then again, as we've heard from the palliative care specialists, <clears throat> if they're given proper palliative care, then they change their minds. So we've got to do a whole lot of education, I think, of people, while they're still well, about what end-of-life issues are, get them talking about it. And um, it, it's not a question, I think, of keeping people alive against their will. When, when somebody says, I refuse treatment, then you must respect that. Unless, of course, they've got a severe mental illness where they can be certified, as they say. That's a different situation. But somebody in the right mind who says, no, I can't take any more, just withdraw treatment, uh, and then you, you respect that and let, let them go. And that's not the same as giving somebody uh, a lethal dose. And I would be very much against the medical profession being involved in that uh, whatsoever. The other thing that strikes me is about, uh, it's a good thing, I think, for people to talk about death and dying, even perhaps when they're young. But again, remembering that there's a great risk of increasing the tendency towards suicide in young people. And that's what worries me perhaps about this, this preliminary declaration in the bill, that it can be made from the age of 16. Now, do they have to be told about that when they're at that age? When they, is there a coming of age at 16? Now you can sign a declaration. And it's the very wrong time to be putting ideas of, su of suicide, of ending their life. Yeah, they can talk about death, perhaps especially when they see friends dying, as it sadly happens, somebody dying in an accident, and that all has to be talked about. But it has to be done in the context of affirming life and giving them a mechanism to deal with the thought of their own, own lives ending. And not to think of suicide, the, the, the deliberate ending of the life, as a way out of a problem. That's, that's what I, I think is the, is the big problem here. Evan Hiles, did you? Thank you. Yeah, I think that helping, uh, letting people go is, is really important, and sometimes helping people to go is really important, and a really important ministry and a very skilled one. There's a kind of mid, midwifery type aspect to helping people to go. It doesn't have to involve, I mean, this bill would be about in, that involving, involving giving drugs that, that, um, that kill them, but, but often what stops people from dying isn't, it's not medical as such. I mean, there are other, other reasons. They might be holding... You no, know, their bodies might be ready, actually, but they're holding out for a critical conversation they need to have with somebody or something has really bothered them that they don't... And they're not quite sure what it is, but a skilled conversation will bring that out and then they relax and they let themselves go. So there's, there's an awful lot of skill in helping people um, to die and it would be great for there to be more resources to enable that to go well. And I, I wonder if... If that were generally people's experience, if that were people's experience generally, there'd probably be, probably be less um, concern to see a bill like this get passed through Parliament. Just, just briefly. Um, I think that what you heard weren't scare stories. They were real stories, and some of them are scary. Um, and we need to listen to all the stories that people tell because they have something to, to add to this conversation. Um, this, is, this is such a complex um, conversation to be having. It's not black or white, it's gray, but gray areas are where people tend to get lost. And my concern again, and I'll keep saying it, is, is all about those people who might get lost if this legislation passed. I think, uh, as I say, I, res I respect many of the, th the faces sitting around here, you know, but the point is, at the end of the day, um, I'm told that uh, if you smoke, you're going to cut years off your life. If you don't eat healthily, you're going to cut years off your life. You know, as, as I said earlier on, we're, we're, we're going to, we know when we were born. None of us know when we're going to die. But, you know, if we are at a point where... And, and, uh, I'm looking at this, Bill, uh, as in people who are really chronically sick, ill, you know, getting to the near the, the, the you know, and, and what I heard with the panel before was, well, we would still want to give you more days. You know, if people want to go, my view is that, you know, let them. Thank you. That was a comment more than no, a, yeah, a yeah, question. Yeah, I think, I think, I, I, I think. Well, why don't you see think, a response to that, however, Richard, to 
Is it possible for that cohort that you're talking about, is it possible to ensure it only happens to them? I think that, that is the problem that's been explored. It's not possible. It, it spills over and it puts the weak and the vulnerable most at risk, and that's surely what the laws of the lands have to do, not enable the, the powerful or the, or the articulate, but to defend the weakest. Yes, please. It happens, suicide happens everywhere. We just take it that it's not a crime or anything. But when suicide happens, uh, as they call it, in custody, in prisons, which is where, you know, expected a lot, there's a big noise happening and there's a big inquiry and everything. So in our hearts, all of us, we think suicide is not really something good. Uh, but if somebody commits suicide himself is one thing, but helping someone with it is another thing. It's adding uh, a load on someone else. Yeah. Uh, you know, I suppose you know, Richard's alluded to and some of the, 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 the paper we have here and, 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 and Mike and the others, that, that, that there are people who don't share your faith or your view and exercise another conscious mm -hmm. decision. And we've had, um, I think it was in res response to the horror stories, uh, some, uh, some examples. But not every family is looking for the inheritance. They would see this as an act of love, yeah. respect for that person. And you know, I'm just, I'm just worrying that you know, the adversarial nature and the strong views don't don't cloud some of some of that out today. I don't know whether there is a, a response to that, but everyone who would wish, if they were request you do so by a loved one to assist in that would probably say don't be so daft you're not a burden you're whatever whatever and there would be a, a whole process there uh, and that person would still insist and we've seen them uh, you know leave the country you know um, they're motivated by the love of that person not necessarily a bad thing is there is there no situation that that you could perceive that assisted suicide would be anything other than a violation of that humanity or, or, or that, you know, is there, there isn't any situation. There is a, an, an intention. And, and uh, the intention can be a good one. But it's not only intentions that count, that count. We have to look at the other consequences of it and the actual action that we're, we're um, legalising <coughs> in, in this society. And that is that there is a power now being granted to some people to bring a person's uh, life to an end. Now, you mentioned that it's, it's our faith tradition, but I, I, I was trying to point out that it's not, a, it's not just a faith. It's, it's, a, it's a, a natural instinct within every human being, within every human society, which has been endorsed by our human rights regimes, that we have to protect this foundation that makes sure that every life is inalienable, and we, we have a complete recognition that there's no discrimination against anyone in our society. I think our society needs that, that foundation. I've got no other um, m members. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Yeah, can I just please, make a comment on what you said there, convener, um, about the, you know, t respecting the loving attitude of, of a family who want to help their, their uh, loved one to end their lives. Now, what concerns me is that it's not just their decision or the person's decision. It's the, it, it's the way it'll affect the person who gives that help, you know, who prescribes the, the lethal drug or, or uh, provides the lethal apparatus, whatever it is. And uh, it would not be right for them to do that. I firmly believe that as a doctor and uh, as a Christian, that it would not be right to give them the means whereby they can end their lives. Now, the, especially as a doctor, because it has always been the tradition of, of the medical profession from the time of Hippocrates to protect life, to care for life until its very end, and not to do anything deliberately to bring about the end of life. Uh, and although this bill attempts to distance the medical profession and the caring professions from the actual act of, of suicide, yet it doesn't. Because when a doctor prescribes uh, a, a drug, he has to say, how much it's it to be taken, how to take it. So he is actually instructing the person to end their lives. He's given an order to end their lives. The person mightn't take it, fair enough. But once he takes it, the doctor is involved. Uh, the, the, the carers who are around, they will also be involved, and they would have conscientious objections too. 
which is not mentioned in the book. Uh, and the facilitator who would be involved, uh, he, he or she would also uh, you know, have severe psychological uh, results from aiding a person to, to end their lives. So I would believe it's not the loving thing to do to give people the means to end their lives. And the means are, are you know, not specified in this bill. It could be anything. It could be you know, a mask with uh, an inert gas like nitrogen in it. Uh, it could be a you know, lethal in injection even. You know, if the person was on a drip, you know, the, the, it could, the stuff could be uh, provided. And the person who was ending their lives would just flick a switch or perhaps with a movement of the eyelid if they couldn't move anything else. It could be arranged. But there again, that's so close to euthanasia. It is euthanasia, I believe. So that, um, you know, the, the principle of it is, I believe, that we should never aid people to end their lives. Yes, we can agree with people who, who want their lives just to come to an end naturally because they get no further treatment, the illness cure, uh, kills them, or even perhaps dehydration might kill them. Although they still will get supportive treatment all the way through, even when they're dry, they can get their mouth uh, moistened, which will relieve a lot of their suffering. But uh, to actually deliberately to end a person's life, uh, th that I think is, should be completely outlawed and uh, never entertained. Yes, please. I, I firmly believe that the vast majority of families um, do what they do out of intense love and concern for the person who is dying. But that does not change what the law would be saying. It's making a qualitative judgment about life. It's saying in broad terms that are quite hard to define, I think, is, is another issue that we could talk about. But we're saying that folk who are terminally ill or who have a life-shortening illness, diabetes is a life-shortening illness. There are lots of life-shortening illnesses. But there is a qualitative statement being made that some life is not quite as worth living as other life. And how does that impact those <laughs> who suffer from those debilitating illnesses or diseases or life-shortening conditions who, quite frankly, would like to live and be supported in that? We're making a judgment, inadvertently, unintentionally, but that's what the law will do. I have no other committee members at this point indicating they want to come in. Of course, uh, that, that, that leads me to um, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks very much, convener. And I was, uh, I'm glad because I was hoping to explore this this particular issue that we were just talking about the how we respond to the the reality that um, sometimes uh, and people are acknowledging it, uh, an act of assisting someone to commit suicide might be undertaken entirely out of love and compassion. Um, the witnesses will be aware that there have been as well as attempts to change the law, both in this jurisdiction and south of the border and elsewhere. There have also been uh, repeated attempts to clarify what the current law is. Uh, south of the border, there's now uh, guidance, uh, uh, guidelines on, on prosecution. We don't have that here. And there's a, a lack of clarity as to whether there are circumstances in which somebody could pr be prosecuted even for arranging for a relative to travel to Dignitas. There's a, there's a lack of clarity about what the current law is. Uh, given that, if somebody assisted the suicide uh, of someone close to them, a relative, uh, there would be perhaps inquiries, perhaps police investigation, perhaps a court case. In those circumstances, if all of the facts lend themselves to the conclusion that someone had acted out of love and compassion uh, and with uh, the complete uh, respect for the autonomy and the decision-making of the person involved, is it the view of the witnesses here that they should, in fact, be prosecuted, convicted and sentenced for a very serious crime? Or does the recognition of compassion come into the question at all? The court, really. At the moment, the, the situation is that the, the court, well, first of all, the Procurator of Fiscal Crown Office uh, would have the responsibility of deciding whether to prosecute. Yeah, and they need, need not prosecute, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a legal matter. Uh, I'm not making any moral or ethical pronouncement about it, but the situation is that they have to decide whether it's, is it a case or whether it's in the public interest. And then once it's in the, in, before the court, the court can decide. There may be extenuating circumstances mm. or any, any 
crime. So it's, it's really under the homicide law, which I think is common law. Um, there's no statute law, I don't think. But um, it, it would be, the court would be free to, to do what it, what it could do. Uh, but uh, I think the moral and ethical question is slightly different from that. All of which leaves. Wouldn't, we, we, I wouldn't support what they, what they did, but, mm. it might, but, it, but it might not be a prosecutable offence under law. I, I would I would be able to that. A lot of responses, Patrick. Yeah. You know, I'll give you the time to come back in. That, that, that this is actually the guidelines which was issued two years ago by the uh, public prosecution in England. South of the border. Which south of the border. Mm. And the main thing, as we said, that he will look at the case, whether it's in the public interest or not, and that sort of thing. So we'll take it case by case because this is something which is considered as uh, an offence now. Uh, but you, Bill, will make it non offence, and that's a different thing. Briefly, it's another yes no question that presupposes that all cases are identical no, no. and that all cases have to have the same answer. Either they're all prosecuted or, they're, or that none of them are prosecuted. But as a couple of people have already said, uh, that is itself a matter of judgment by a number of public officials before it gets that far. And I don't think anybody around the table is suggesting that that is in any way wrong. But in fact, it's implicit in that, that we don't need a new law that says that the answer is always no, it should never be prosecuted, which is the proposal before us. And I think the on-the-ground the on the situation for, for probably all, all faith groups or ministers within, within them is that on the ground, you, you would, if, you, if you knew the family, you would be supporting them. Uh, and that's why you don't have ministers on juries and things, because, I mean, their job is, you know, their on-the-ground job is, is to be alongside with people on their morning bench or in their compassion or with mm. whatever they've done, whether you agree with it or not. Um, you're, you just sit there, you, you're with them. It does yeah. just strike me that we... <clears throat> we're perhaps um, not fully expressing the compassion that we're talking about if we are leaving people with that complete lack of clarity yeah. uh, about whether yeah. an action they take might be legal or illegal, yeah. uh, whether it would be prosecuted or not prosecuted, yeah. uh, whether in fact it is, it is culturally and socially sanctioned or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I suppose what I'm asking is, do you think the current situation is satisfactory? PPP's guidance uh, being given out, the Lord Advocate con uh, commented that in Scotland uh, the, the law was quite clear. Uh, I'm not sure if, I, if that's precisely the phrase that was used, but I, I, I think there have certainly been many other views suggesting that the, the current situation is, is not clear. Um, perhaps I could come on to a, another question. If, I oh, I beg your pardon. Whether it was satisfactory or not, I may have... Okay. Um, uh, well, I believe it is satisfactory, uh, but again, there should be more education of the public as to end-of-life issues, what I was saying earlier, and that people have a whole lot of misunderstandings ab about that, and that's why they get so het up about it and say, oh yes, people are being kept alive artificially, and we, we should have some legislation. But whereas when the situation is explained to them, that's why we can't rely on public opinion polls, because they change depending on the question you ask, you know, and what the understanding of the person is. Once you, you uh, explain to them about the end-of-life issue and palliative care, the number in favour of le legalising assisted suicide comes way down, I, I believe. So it's, it's not a, just a, a straightforward thing. I think any time people are suffering and struggling and, and feeling that they don't have the support that they need, it's not satisfactory. I think what, what might help is earlier intervention and people walking alongside in those early struggles and letting them have those questions, those explorations. Um, how can we best help you and support you as you walk through this? And not just the person, but the whole family. So I think, you know, that's one of the things faith groups can do. It's one of the things that communities can do. It's one of the things that healthcare professionals can do is get in there early and walk alongside folk so that they don't have to suffer and struggle by themselves. I appreciate that, and I, I mm. respect the sentiment of it very, mm. very much. I, I do still worry that we would be asking that question, how best can we support you, uh, while still at the back of our mind saying, if you give one answer, I'm, I'm not going to help. Um, 
the, there's a, another question I wanted to ask, which uh, Reverend Dr. MacDonald mentioned opinion polls, and it's, it's about the balance of, of views. Some people will place a lot of importance on opinion polls, and others say you know, questions lend one, lead one way or the other, or that people haven't considered the question in depth. Uh, but there is there's very little evidence, as far as I can see, that the balance of views, whatever level of importance you place on opinion polls, is particularly different between the population at large and the major denominations. Uh, it's also clear that there are, albeit not amongst the panel of witnesses who've been invited to speak today, there is a range of views amongst religious communities, including uh, people who are very uh, committed and involved uh, uh, within religious organisations about these issues. Um, I'll mention uh, Reverend Scott McKenna, who spoke at the launch of the bill when Margaret MacDonald published and introduced the bill, uh, talking about this as an attempt uh, merely to bring peace of mind, and, and spoke very clearly that he regarded it as uh, an act of uh, Christian compassion. Uh, we've also heard elsewhere in, in the UK from a former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, uh, who um, said, those arguments that persuaded me in the past not to support a change in the law, seem to lack power and authority now when confronted with the experiences of those suffering a painful death. He went on in talking about Lord Falconer's bill to say, there is nothing anti-Christian about embracing the reforms that Lord Falconer's bill offers. Uh, Rabbi Dr Jonathan Romaine uh, said that this, uh, this debate is not, as it is often thought, a battle between the religious and secular camps, but within the religious community too. There are many, he says, who have a, both a deep faith and a desire to see assisted dying legalised in Britain as a voluntary option for the terminally ill. Uh, he says that there are a growing number of clergy like myself uh, who are only too familiar with those dying in pain and uh, want to see them allowing the option of assisted death if they so wish. And at a global level, perhaps one of the most famous religious figures in the world, Desmond Tutu, uh, has also uh, written about this. Uh, I revere the sanctity of life, but not at any cost. Uh, and he goes on to acknowledge uh, many of the issues of context which have been reflected in the discussion today, uh, but also to um, say that he would not be against. Uh, I think he said, uh, uh, I think a lot of people would be upset if I said I wanted assisted dying. I would say uh, I wouldn't mind, actually. So I wonder whether the witnesses could reflect on why none of the organisations have chosen to uh, acknowledge that I, I think um, uh, Efren Borowski's written evidence does acknowledge this, but, but most of the others, and certainly the discussion here, doesn't reflect the range of views which exist, uh, both among those who subscribe to a religious affiliation and those uh, who uh, are extremely active uh, and uh, have given the matter great thought in that context. Yes, please. Just to follow on from that, um, thank Patrick Harvey for acknowledging that we did acknowledge the range of views within the Jewish community. I think it's fair to say that there is what one might call a denominational split within the Jewish community. Uh, the Orthodox community is steadfastly opposed to the proposals. The liberal community is by and large in favour uh, with caveats and the reform community is I think yet making its mind up. So I acknowledge that. However, uh, I think where there is, I, I'm cautious about saying unanimity because it's the Jewish community I'm talking about, um, but there is well nigh um, unanimity, I think, about the need for far greater safeguards than there are in the proposals as, as they are before us at the moment. Um, and you've referred kindly to, to our written submission that goes through a large number of issues where we feel that there is a, a need for considerably greater safeguards. Um, and now I think is not the time to go through those one by one. But that, again, takes us back to, to practicalities as opposed to principle. But the principle of the bill as it stands before us is one which I think the, the Jewish community, by and large, would be opposed to. Any other witnesses? <laughs> The, 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 the SEC, in our, the SEC submission, we, we um, did say that there's, there are diverse views within within the SEC, and I think probably within you know, so I think many individuals feel quite conflicted. Um, and we made reference to Hans Kuhn, who's an important Roman Catholic theologian, who 
um, has made a case for dignified dying in, in this kind of a way. And I think they're really important. I think it's really important, actually, that, that each of, you know, that there are voices um, that, that enable the arguments then to become very good, you know, arguments. I mean, it's, it's iron sharpening iron, if you can have that debate within, within a faith community. Um, and, uh, you know, if Desmond Tutu, you know, I'm very... <laughs> Great uh, follower of Desmond Tutu, so you know it's it, it's 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 influential for him to say something like that. Um, I think what's troubling, what what concerns me about the context of this conversation is that we, as we heard in the last panel, um, our cultural context is one that tends to not look at death, not not mm. feel very comfortable around death, and we know that the writing of wills and powers of attorney and uh, advanced directives and things is is um, is very low, um, as is the, there's an increasing trend towards people not wanting to have funerals. Um, so there's a, a sort of, a, a, in some way, a denial that death will come and then a denial that death has happened and a, a discomfort about looking at death. And that lack of familiarity of death does make us frightened of death. And I'm conscious that we have, on the one hand, a kind of denial of death and then on the other hand, a strenuous effort to allow us to choose it and have other people kill us. And it's that context that troubles me, I suppose. I think the, the voices that uh, Patrick Harvey mentioned are really minority voices in, the, in all the Christian denominations, certainly in our small denomination, which is a conservative or a small C um, denomination. I, I don't know if anybody who would support assisted suicide there are no doubt there are individuals, but I, I don't know about them. Uh, so the, the, I think the majority of the faith communities would be against this in, in, in general. And sadly, I think many of those who would be in favour of it, again, haven't really studied it in enough detail, uh, as we are doing at the moment, and as you, as the committee is doing. And I'm glad about that. I'm very impressed with the, you know, the deep interest you've taken in, in this, and I encourage you to, um, you know, to weigh up all the evidence that you've, you've heard because I think the evidence is very much uh, against legalising uh, this uh, assisted suicide in any form whatsoever. Yes, that's what I think. The Church of Scotland is a broad church, and so almost on every issue there's going to be um, different opinions, and that's a good thing because it, it makes for good discussions. Um, not that long ago, um, this issue came to the General Assembly, and this is the policy that we have. Um, at the last General Assembly, it was asked of the Church and Society Council, and we embraced it, that we reflect again on this. Um, there will be a <coughs> round table in the next couple of months, and we'll continue those conversations quite widely and deeply. But again, it comes down to not looking at, you know, we, we look at death as, as very personal and private and my, my death. Um, and we sometimes, and if you look at it that way, then my right to decide um, seems completely and utterly sensible. It's when you dig a bit deeper and you look at the community aspect of, of all our lives and how my life and my death and the way I choose may have implications that are unforeseen for others. And for that reason, I think that's one of the main reasons for the Church of Scotland's um, decision to, to oppose this legislation. There are also so many safeguards that need to be put in place with this particular um, piece of legislation that it, it is quite troubling. Can I thank you all for uh, your attendance here? Uh, the written evidence that you provided and indeed the oral evidence today. Thank you very much indeed. We very much appreciate the valuable time you've given us. Thank you. Session, well, we're now in private session. For, for how long, we don't know.